All persons having business before the Honorable Associate Judges, now presiding of the District Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in session. Please come to order. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We have three cases on the calendar this morning. I apologize to uh, counsel here and uh, counsel in our uh, forthcoming cases for the delay that we encountered. Uh, hopefully we will, everything will go smoothly now. The first case on the calendar, which I will now call, is uh, Alfred Gibson versus United States. Counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, everybody. May it please the court. My name is Russell Bykoff. Uh, if I may, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. I plan to address a, a fatal weakness in count two, in uh, proof of count two in the government's case, uh, and then move on to the question of whether counts one and two merge. So um, I'll just observe, this is a uh, fairly simple set of facts, but the issues, uh, at least uh, to me, it become at times mind bogglingly uh, complicated um, in part because it once again could require this court to address the interplay between the um, general sexual offenses of the ASAA and the victim specific offenses uh, where the victim is uh, a minor or a child. So uh, with that said, I'll plunge right in. Uh, the count two conviction is a misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor. And I'll try to refer to that as MSM or sometimes uh, MSA, misdemeanor sexual abuse, M for minor. Um, the trial judge failed to consider, uh, despite all her many pages of findings and legal conclusions, she failed to consider some basic elements of the crime and failed to reach a legal conclusion about a critical element of MSA minor or MSN. And that is whether Mr. Gibson touched uh, AG, the youngsters or the minors, bare skin close to her genitalia. Um, so I'm going to I'm sorry, uh, you said let you go. Bear, I'm sorry, Mr. Bykoff, you said touch to bare skin. Touch um, bare skin. Is that uh, required for sexually suggestive conduct? It is in this case, Your Honor, because the government made an election with their um, charging document and then with their proof at trial. Okay. So, I, I yeah. mean, regardless of the findings, I thought that we were here on a sufficiency challenge and I see evidence in the testimony that the complainant is wearing shorts and that um, your client touches her on her inner thigh closer to her groin area. Um, so why is that not sexually suggestive conduct under DC code um, 30101, sorry, 22, 30, 10, 01B2. Well, it's not because the judge failed to make sufficient factual findings and failed to reach a legal conclusion that it was close to the genitalia. Uh, oh, the wait, statute... I, you're talking about factual findings, but I, again, I thought you made it, you were making a sufficiency challenge. So are you I also... Am challenging the court's factual, so so my question goes to sufficiency. Okay. And if, there, well, if there's testimony in the record that the complainant is wearing shorts and that your client touches her on her inner thigh, above the knee, you know, closer to the groin area than to the knee. So if you bisect someone's thigh and you have, you know, the midpoint of the thigh and then it's above that, 
closer to the groin area, why is that not sufficient evidence under 22301B2? Well, that's right, Your Honor. Her testimony was that the touching uh, of the inner thigh, and I think uh, one of the few things that the government and the appellant, appellants agree on is that there was a glancing touching with the fingertips on the inner thigh. Uh, well, wait a second. I mean, again, going back to the testimony, um, there's there's more than one touch, right? I mean, there are multiple yeah. touches. There's, there's a touch of the leg, and then there's a touch of the face, and then there's another, there was a, there was initial glancing touch, then there's a touch of the face, then there's a, a more grasping touch. There, there's more than one touch of the leg, and the, the touch that was closer to the groin area is the last in the sequence. Um, and so that's the touch that I'm referring to, that is above the knee, above the midpoint of the thigh, closer to the groin area. Um, well, you're I absolutely think right. That's what the testimony you're reflects. You're right, absolutely right, Your Honor. The testimony was that uh, there was a, this, a second touching and this, uh, by the way, was the only touching that counted, according to the judge, uh, the, the second touching. Uh, this is the one where the victim testified she moved her leg away and the uh, defendant, Mr. Gibson, was unable to grab her leg, but she was wearing shorts and the tips of his fingers touched her inner thigh uh, beyond the midpoint between her knee and her hip. So she mentions her hip and she mentions um, her groin, uh, but she nobody mentions the genitalia. And the statute requires that uh, the touching be close to, quote, two words, close to, close quote, the genitalia. And, and how, uh, how can something be close to the groin and not close to genitalia? Well, there's a difference, I think. Uh, and this, this may be a uh, beyond my uh, scope uh, as a, a lawyer, I'm not a medical expert or an expert in physiology, but uh, the genitalia uh, is one thing, and that's what the, those, that's the word the statute uses, and the statute says close to the genitalia, uh, but the trial was all about the hip and the groin and the knee and the inner thigh. So at least I mean, on this count... Yeah, I mean... I don't the, groin, I, the groin and genitalia tend to exist in roughly the same space, counsel, and uh, I don't know why we would hold a trial court to invoking magic words when she said quite clearly, this, these are her findings, since you're taking issue with her findings, at some point he puts his hand again on her thigh with his fingers landing on the inner side of her thigh, closest to what would be called the groin area, based on the testimony in this case. You know, maybe the trial judge is just peckish about using the word genitalia in her ruling, um, but I don't recall an objection to uh, in the trial court that that wasn't enough, permitting the trial court to clarify that what she meant when she said the groin area was consistent with genitalia, which seems well, like a fair statute, reading. The statute, Your Honor, uses genitalia. It doesn't, the statute doesn't use groin. The statute doesn't use hip. And I'll, I'm going to read the uh, judge's conclusions of law in their entirety for this count. Uh, well, can count I ask division. you, I, I'm sorry, if we're gonna get all uh, technical about terminology, if, if you had a very self-aware young woman who said, he touched me two inches from my vulva, you would say that is insufficient evidence to say he touched her close to her genitalia? I would say that close to, in the words of the statute, is clearly a judgment call. No, no, but, no, we're not, I think at this point, we're not talking about the close to, we're talking about the genitalia. And you're, you're taking issue with the fact that the judge didn't use the word genitalia. And right. Judge Deal then asked you about groin and said, isn't that essentially synonymous, right? Might be slightly broader. Um, you know, to include the back and the front, I don't know. Um, but, but if you have a, if you have a very, you know, educated, self-aware about her body complainant who, who uses 
biologically correct terms more precise and says, he touched me X distance, which is close to my vulva. Would you say because she used that biological term that that doesn't count as genitalia? I, I just, I'm not quite sure I understand what your argument is. I, uh, I would not say that. I would say that if, had she testified and mentioned a vulva, a vulva, we know, we know from, from biology that that's part of the genitalia. That's not an issue. But okay, I'm, never, so I'm not she, aware that... If she testifies that he touched me on my upper inner thigh, we all know what's above the upper inner thigh. Why does she have to use the word? Why does the court have to use the word? Why can't we just say that is close to genitalia? Well, because that's not what the statute says. The statute gives the, uh, the option to the government of manifold ways of proving a case like this. And in this case, um, let's, let me turn to 22.30.10 for a minute. Um, so we can see all the many ways and the government elected in its, in its um, information uh, that um, Mr. Gibson being 18 years or older and being in a significant relationship, which is also an important statutory term, um, siblings related by blood, with AG, a minor under 18 years, which is another issue, that is 17 years old, engaged in sexually suggestive conduct, that is, with a minor, that is conduct, contact between Mr. Gibson's hand and AG's inner thigh, which was intended to cause and reasonably did cause sexual arousal and sexual gratification. So the government uh, in its information charges a touching between of, from Mr. Gibson's hand with AG's inner thigh. Uh, and the statute then says that in subsection uh, B2, touching a minor inside or outside his or her clothing close to the genitalia and several other uh, body parts in that area. Um, so the government uh, was trying to show a touching, a touching on the inner thigh, but the statute requires a spec specificity of close to the genitalia. And- Mr. Bankoff, may I ask you a question about this? Yes, sir. Um, do, do, you, do you agree that the misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor statute is a lesser included offense of the second degree sexual abuse of a minor statute. Your Honor, I, um, I think that may be from one of the cases. Fortunately for, for me, um, that crime was not charged in this case. We only have- Well, but you see, what I'm wondering is this, when you say that crime wasn't charged in that case. That crime involves sexual contact rather than um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the specific sexual touchings uh, in the misdemeanor statute. And touching the victim here on her inner thigh would have been sexual contact. Do you agree with that? It falls within the definition of sexual contact. Yes, under the first count, so, misdemeanor sexual so, abuse. So it, it, so it would have been, um, so the evidence here would have been sufficient to convict Mr. Um, Gibson, uh, not simply of the misdemeanor, but of second degree sexual abuse of a minor a felony. It seems odd to think that the conduct proven would have been sufficient to convict him of the greater offense, the felony, but not sufficient to convict him of what seems like a lesser, perhaps lesser included, offense of misdemeanor. Well, Your Honor, I actually never, I didn't look carefully into the felony and the felony elements because that's not part of this case, but I will uh, argue that uh, speaking of lesser included offenses, uh, in this case, as charged and as proved, the, uh, that count 
um, count one, uh, misdemeanor sexual abuse, MSA, is a lesser included of MSM, misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor. And therefore- Is that we true? Is it true that you can't can, can commit misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor without committing misdemeanor sexual abuse? I'm not sure that's right. I, I think it is right in the context of this case, Your Honor, and it depends what we're looking at. Um, and we wanna compare apples and apples and, and not uh, apples to oranges. Um, I think what, where, what the um, analysis under, uh, under Just, block- can, can I ask an example? If, if somebody, sure. if he had put her back, uh, his hand uh, on her waistline, close to the buttocks under 3010.01b2. Um, that would not satisfy a misdemeanor sexual assault because he didn't touch an enumerated body part. Uh, he was close to it, uh, which is allowed under 3010, but not under misdemeanor sexual assault, I believe. Um, so why, why isn't that preclude a merger? That you can commit, you can, commit the misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor without committing misdemeanor sexual assault by being close to a body part that would not satisfy a misdemeanor sexual assault. Well, but in this case, it was charged uh, with the touching of the inner thigh, which is a misdemeanor sexual assault, and it was proved. So we have the- that how we do a Blockburger analysis for merger purposes. Well, I we think- don't, uh, don't we look at the elements of, of the crime instead of the, the facts of the particular case, right? And you can think of all sorts of different factual scenarios along the lines that Judge Deal just mentioned. You know, if someone touches me uh, or a, a child on their collarbone, right? Maybe that's close to the breast, but that is not touching the breast. So it's not misdemeanor sexual abuse, but it could be misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor. Um, you, can, you can play out with the close to language, you can play out all sorts of different scenarios, but you have to look at the statutory language, not the actual facts to do the Blockburger analysis, no? Right. Under Blockburger, we look to the elements, but what elements are we comparing given the manifold ways in which both of these crimes can be committed under the statute? There, there are many, looking at the statute, there are many different options that uh, can exist. In uh, common sense, uh, Your Honor. Well, how suggests... narrow do you want us to go, right? I mean, I would think that we would at least look at, compare what constitutes se sexually suggestive conduct with what constitutes sexually su uh, sexual contact, right? But what, what narrower frame do you want to apply to the statutory analysis? I would start with what the elements are in the government's charging documents and then look at what the proof, what the elements were that the government attempted to prove a trial. And in this case, we can line up the elements of these two misdemeanor crimes, the, uh, the, not, the one that's not victim specific, uh, MSA, which is 22-3006. And um, we see that that uh, has uh, a sexual act or sexual contact. And then this, the next element would be knowledge or reason to know that the act is without permission. And then the third element would be an intent to arouse or gratify the sex, sexual desire of the victim or the defendant. Then the second uh, statute, uh, MSA minor, which is 22-3010.01, is sexually suggestive conduct with a minor under the age 18, which in pertinent part includes touching outside the minor's clothing close to the genitalia. And I would suggest that that element and the first element that I mentioned in the other statute, sexual acts or sexual contact are essentially the same as charged and proved in this case. In fact, the government is getting literally, literally getting double duty out of the single touching that Mr. Gibson committed against AG's inner thigh. There, uh, that one touching is the it, you're, you're, you're making an argument that sounded pretty good before Blockburger. I mean, before Blockburger, okay. transactions, you know, single transaction 
might have gotten you all the way home, free block burger, but now it just sounds irrelevant to me um, from a merger well, analysis. It is a single transaction. And what we're doing in this case is uh, looking at um, an attempt, a possibility to convict and punish uh, twice for the same act. Um, and the judge backed away from that because the judge, the trial judge noted uh, the possibility of a merger. And uh, the government did ask for consecutive sentences. The judge imposed a 180 day concurrent sentence. So I think basically the first element is going to be the same. The second element uh, the, the, um, is uh, an MSA, uh, simple MSA, knowledge or reason to know the act is without permission, raises a very important issue for this court based on uh, your precedents in Ray MS and, um, and Davis, uh, of whether that applies at all for a 17 or 16 or 17 year old minor who's facing, uh, who's been the victim of a simple MSA charge. There may not be, in fact, any requirement uh, to prove the, uh, that the defendant um, uh, had knowledge of a lack of permission. Um, haven't, we, haven't we held that in the, spe in the minor specific cases where the, where the other elements are satisfied, the uh, minor's consent is um, uh, is not a defense. Well, by its own, by its very own terms, yes, your honor. By its very own terms, uh, MSM and the all the victim-specific uh, line of statutes takes removes consent as a uh, as a defense, and it removes uh, the elements of knowledge of lack of permission as an element the government has to prove. And you have removed the court, this court has removed from simple, the non-victim specific statute, uh, misdemeanor sexual abuse, 3001. There is no requirement for children uh, for the government to prove that the uh, defendant was uh, unaware of. In fact, NRA MS suggests, says that there's a conclusive presumption that the sexual contact was committed without the minor's permission, without the child's permission. And I think it's a, I think the, uh, that case and the logic behind it would suggest, suggest very strongly to me that it's a very, very short step for this court to say that uh, minors as well do not give their permission. And that there's a conclusive presumption uh, that in the generic, MSA statute 3006 uh, that the uh, uh, act was committed without the minor's permission. If you look at it that way and that element is gone, then the two statutes are pretty much the same. The key test according to NRA MS is whether Mr. Gibson could commit MSM, the victim specific with the, uh, the special relationship uh, without at the same time committing MSA. And on the facts of this case, there's no way he could commit the MSM with his uh, recently discovered sister. She's under 18. He's over 18. Uh, there's the intent to sexually gratify or arouse. Uh, so he commits, he commits 3006 simple MSA in the course of committing MSM under 3010. That's our All case. Right, let us, let us we will give you a few minutes in rebuttal. Let us hear from counsel for the government. And, thank you. Um, Mr. Thank, you thank you very much. Uh, your honors, uh, good morning. My name is Stephen Snyder and I represent the United States. Um, on the sufficiency question, the evidence was sufficient to sustain both convictions. The victim testified um, repeatedly that the defendant, among other things, excuse me, the appellant, touched her on her inner thigh, as she described, closer to her groin. She gave a physical demonstration for the court in open court, and the judge, who was in the best opportunity to see this, actually saw her give the demonstration, and then the judge found um, in several, uh, at least twice, 
that the appellant touched her on her thigh closer uh, to the groin. Additionally, when uh, the government was arguing on the motion for judgment of acquittal, among other things, uh, with respect to misdemeanor sexual uh, assault of a minor, MSM, the government argued that the um, appellant touched the victim close to the genitalia. So that was before the judge. And I, I think uh, based on this, the evidence certainly established that the appellant touched her close to the genitalia. And at trial, um, the appellant didn't argue anything about um, whether there's a distinction between the groin or genitalia or anything of the sort. The argument at trial was intent. Uh, it wasn't um, the, for lack of a better term, the sufficiency of the government's proof. And so uh, as we uh, noted in our brief, appellant can't argue, um, well, uh, appellant cannot show that the court plainly erred in not giving a more specific description. The uh, this defense issue, counsel. Yes, I'm sorry. I was going to say this issue has not been raised, nor was it raised in our previous um, misdemeanor um, sexual abuse of a minor case. But I wonder if you have a view on whether the statutory phrasing close to, be it the genitalia or other parts of the body mentioned in the statute. Um, uh, is um, is is not su is su is sufficiently pre precise so as not to be unduly vague. Um, I we haven't uh, considered that question. It hasn't been raised, so I don't know whether that broad language um, is an issue. An appellant hasn't raised a due process challenge here, so um, I, I I haven't uh, focused on that. Okay. Um, but in any event, uh, the. Given the uh, findings of the trial court and particularly appellant's uh, trial counsel's failure to seek more specific findings under rule, uh, Superior Court Rule of Criminal Procedure 23, uh, namely whether uh, groin or close to the genitalia are, um, are close enough or synonymous so, so as to fall within the ambit of the statute, I don't believe there's any basis um, for appellant to challenge uh, the sufficiency of the evidence. Um, so if the court has no more questions on sufficiency, I'll move on to the merger question. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understand stood what you just said, that sure. there, there were no challenge to the court's findings. Um, so, so we shouldn't worry about that, but you're not making an argument, are you, that the sufficiency of the evidence as to the location of the touch is unpreserved or are no, you are you no no, no 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 i'm not making that argument okay. at all okay thank you no. <laughs> sure um so with respect to the merger question um as this court and other courts have found repeatedly the question is whether um well bringing it to this case whether uh one can commit msm without committing MSA? And the answer to the question is yes. And the reason is because there are um, substantively different um, elements. You certainly have uh, the elements uh, with respect to MSM of a minor in a, a special relationship, but also in MSM, the government is required to prove that the, um, a defendant engaged in sexually suggestive conduct and that conduct is to sexually arouse himself or others. Whereas in MSA, uh, the government is required to prove that a defendant made sexual contact and the sexual contact is to abuse, humiliate, harass, degrade, or arouse or gratify the sexual desire of any person. And those are different elements. So uh, it is possible and the court actually gave a number of examples uh, to um, commit MSM without committing MSA, such as by touching a, um, a victim, a with a 17-year-old girl with whom the um, uh, defendant is in a special relationship, say, you know, on the shoulder, close to, but not on the breast, or touching underneath the sleeve of a shirt, 
um, anywhere, you know, touching her forearm under the sleeve of the shirt, assuming the intent elements are met. Um, and so therefore, because and, and those, those acts would not constitute um, MSA. So therefore, it is possible to um, uh, commit MSM without um, committing MSA. Um, appellant argues, he says, on the facts of this case, they merge. But the courts are clear that you don't look to the facts of the case. We look to the elements, and then, as this court has stated, the practical question of whether it is possible to commit one, um, one offense without committing the other offense. And because it is possible to commit MSM, because we have these two different elements, the court is not even required to address the, um, the consent issue that appellant raises, which is whether a 17-year-old um, minor should be considered um, presumptively unable to grant consent or permission uh, within the ambit of MSA. This court has never addressed that question. And yet the, the government submitted a 28K letter going to that question. Do you want to speak to that at all? Well, I submitted the uh, 28K letter because we came across that decision and it uh, the decision which was decided after uh, we filed our briefs and it did address the consent issue. And so I wanted to um, apprise or appraise the court of its its existence. I don't believe the case is dispositive. And in, in, in the end, that case does several things. One of which is it um, leaves open, well, it doesn't address the issue of consent with respect to MSA because that issue wasn't raised. But in the case of simple assault um, and a nonviolent sexual touching, the Augustine court did find that um, a minor, in other words, a, a person above the age of 16, but below the age of 18, um, consent could be a defense, if my understanding of Augustine is correct, um, with respect to simple assault. But that didn't, the court, that court didn't address MSA. So it's a little bit of a long answer. Because I apologize. I, I, yes. MSA right. wasn't charged in that case. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. MSM was charged in the case. And right. so that was, that ultimately was the nexus. Um, but that case doesn't compel um, a different analysis of our current case or a different result in that case. Um, because again, here, the actus reus between MSA and MSM, actus reus is, are different. Sexual contact in MSA, sexually suggestive conduct in MSM. And those uh, two offenses also have different, um, different uh, mens re um, elements. And so therefore, uh, because you can commit MSM without um, committing MSA, MSA does not merge into MSM and the court's not even required to um, address the uh, consent question. If the, uh, if the court has no more questions, um, the United States asks that the judgment, judgment of the Superior Court be affirmed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berkhoff, a few minutes. Well, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to just uh, come back, if I may, to um, the... Uh, interplay between the two arguments I was making uh, without going into uh, such detail again. Um, my arguments uh, on the existence of a merger with uh, MSA being a lesser included offense of MSM in this case is uh, in the alternative. So the court, should the court agree with our first argument uh, that uh, the judge um, failed to find that the uh, touching of the inner thigh was close to the genitalia, uh, then um, if the court agrees with, with us there, then there's no need to uh, consider the merger because the, the count, uh, count one, or count, count two 
uh, would be uh, dismissed as based on insufficient evidence. And let, let me, because it came up, let me just uh, uh, go uh, give uh, citations to the record uh, should uh, the panel um, wish to examine the testimony by the victim, AG, in this case. Um, the, uh, we describe uh, that evidence on page six of appellant's brief, including footnote five. Uh, and then I direct the court's attention to uh, the first day's testimony, December 13th, pages 63, and then pages 65 through 67, uh, the testimony of AG about uh, the, my client's effort to grab her leg while sitting next to her when he momentarily touches her inner thigh with his fingertips between her knee and her hip, but closer to her hip. Uh, pages 68 and 69 uh, of that same transcript, December 13th, uh, involve the uh, AG again describing that conduct. Cross-examination was on the second day of testimony, December 17th, pages 10 to 15 include the demonstration by AG of the touching and the judge observes it's the upper part of the inside of her thigh and neither attorney object to that. Then the judge reaches her conclusions of law on count two, MSM, on pages 41 to 42 of the second day of the testimony, December 17th. The judge says with respect to count two, misdemeanor sexual abuse, I do find and that would be uh, count two is MSM. It's not exactly, mis it's not misdemeanor sexual abuse. That's a bit confusing. The judge says, I do find that again, Mr. Gibson touched AG's thigh when they were sitting on the couch and he touched the top of her leg, again, her bare leg with his hand really in the context of saying she was a beautiful effing girl or woman, although constantly referred to her as well as his baby sister or periodically did so. And I do, quote, continues, and I do find that he did so, a 40-year-old man with an intent to arouse his own sexual desire or based on his sexual desire and to arouse himself sexually. And I do find as to the, so that's the second count of misdemeanor sexual abuse of a minor. And again, the testimony was that Mr. Gibson was more than 40 years old at the time of those acts. So I believe that the, um, the uh, sufficiency of count uh, two is very much in play on MS, MSM. Um, it was preserved uh, as Judge Easterly points out. Uh, the argument we are making now uh, is that the evidence was insufficient. Uh, close to, as I may have said before, and forgive me, was clearly, is clearly a judgment call, but the trial judge seemed to be entirely unaware of this requirement and she simply never addressed it with either a factual finding or a conclusion of law. Uh, to find that the evidence was sufficient to sustain conviction on count two, it seems to me would require that this court speculate about how close Mr. Gibson came to a prohibited body part, body location, or how far away his fingers were from the genitalia. And uh, I'll stop with that if there are no I, further questions. I, yes, right. I just want to, I mean, that seems to be a different argument that along the lines of what Judge Glickman was suggesting about the statute being vague, that close to has to be a specific distance from. But, you know, it's, it's hard to square your argument that the court ignored the close to aspect of it when on page 39, the court makes a finding, I think this is the court, am I looking at our, yes, this is the court on page 39 says, at some point he puts his hand again on her thigh with his fingers landing on the inner side of her thigh closest to what would be called the groin area based on the testimony in the case. And the testimony in the case is really, I mean, you know, I guess the defense went for it. It was really trying to get her to say on cross-examination that the touch was closer to the knee and it didn't work. Um, and she said, you know, on page 14, um, you know, the question was, it's down closer to your knee than to your groin area? No, it's closer to my groin area than my knee. 
Um, and then she says, can I show you? And the defense is trying to back off, I guess, and says, that's all right, I understand. And then there's a demonstration and then the court says, based on this court's ob observation, it's the upper part of the inside of her thigh and no one objects. So it seems like there is a specific finding about the location and it is based on the testimony and to the extent that your argument is it has to be close to, has to be a quantifiable distance, that just hasn't been briefed for us. No, and I'm not saying that it is. I'm, I'm just, I'm conceding, uh, Your Honor, that it, close to is a judgment call, but the trial judge never uh, made that judgment, whether it was close to the genitalia, uh, because she was focused on touching the inner thigh. And uh, she did focus on, uh, or there was testimony about, uh, as, as we've said, being closer to the hip or the groin, but uh, no one really focused on the statutory element that the government relied on. Uh, under the um, uh, MSM statute to show, to prove uh, that it was a sexually suggestive uh, conduct. Um, and we're not, we, did, we did not raise a due process argument at trial. We didn't brief it here, we're just, we, but we are focusing on uh, sufficiency and arguing that it's it was insufficient uh, evidence. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Your Honors. Counsel, thank you both. You may, you are excused and you may log off. Thank you. Okay, we got some people. Got the judges. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we call the second case, Ruth Saunders versus Stephen Hudgens uh, et al. Um, Mr. Lasley, you may proceed. Uh, I'm a little challenged here, Judge. I'm going to make sure I got the right thing. Uh, my name is Michael Lasley. I'm the, the appellant on behalf of Ruth Saunders. And I was asked to reserve at least three to five minutes in rebuttal. The, the first, the first uh, point I wanted to make in this, in this appeal is that Judge Pan did not follow the mandate in this court to allow Ruth Saunders to consider the specific performance by, look, she did not review the circumstances of the, of the uh, it committed reverse wear in terms of the uh, fairly consideration of the pleadings that she made in this matter, and also in reference to the conduct and conspiracy and torches, a, a conduct of, of Mr. Arnold, and as well as the circumstances of the interference and the jury verdict and the order and memorandum of Judge Macaluso in determining whether Ruth Saunders was entitled to specific performance. Rather, the uh, Judge Pan would adopt adopted the arguments of the appellee, Mr. Arnold, that pre pretty much concluded, Your Honors, that it challenged the actual rulings of the and verdict of the jury by claiming that the contract was not valid, which is the thing that Judge Macaluso found with the verdict fi and findings of the jury. I don't, so, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true, counsel. Um, there are two different things, two different questions in my mind. One is, was there a contract for purposes of tortious interference of contract or breach of contract? And then there's a separate question for specific performance of whether or not its terms are sufficiently definitive to, you know, order that they be carried out. And here, and we have cases that say, you know, those two things, you can have a contract for purposes of enforcing a breach of contract claim, a torts interference claim, that could still be not definitive enough on its terms to order specific performance. Um, I can cite a few if you want, but do you have any reaction to that? Yes, I do, Your Honor. The, the, the main thing is you cannot, in, in the context of saying she was not ready and able to perform the terms of the contract, out of the context, 
of the conspiracy and tortures interference of the contract. So uh, the, the terms of the contract was somewhat negated by the failure and the conspiracy of uh, Mr. Huggins and Mr. Arnold in terms of they, what they did to keep her from even trying to fulfill the terms of the contract. So what, what's relevant in this, in this context is that you cannot argue that she was not uh, able to fill the terms of the contract and she was not, unable to uh, uh, dictate to uh, Mr. Huggins what she was trying to achieve by, by the whole focus of what the contract was supposed to say and do. So you, you, the, the, the case law focuses on the fact that you cannot negate a contract, you cannot negate the circumstances of a contract by the conduct of the uh, one of the parties, and in this case, uh, Mr. Huggins and then Mr. Arnold. That, so uh, the, the the notion that the contract was not uh, the terms of the contract was not not fulfilled was negated by the fact that the contracts were were, were undermined by their their conduct and conspiracy. And what the no, let me let me just separate out two points again. Um, okay. One point is. Your client didn't fulfill the terms of the contract in the past. That's one thing. And, and I agree with you that if, you know, the other side breached, you know, that can't be held against you. There's another question of, for purposes of ordering specific performance, has, have you and your client demonstrated that you are ready now to proceed with the terms of the sale to cover the first mortgage, to pay the money, have you secured those funds? That's a separate question. It's a separate question that I read the trial court to be saying, no, you have not demonstrated that you're ready, willing, and able to go forward with specific performance. And I haven't seen a response to that in your briefing. And so what, do you have one? Well, yes, we do. Like, basically, it's that you haven't lined up, your ducks haven't, you haven't lined up your ducks in a row. Uh, well, well the, the point is, we, we, the, the ability to hand the, the line up the ducks in a row is based on the fact that with they with the negation of the of the contract itself by the appellant lawyer. Uh, 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 Why? Uh, Why? No, 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 counsel. I mean, hear me out for a second. Okay. Uh, when it goes back, we went back before the trial court to consider whether or not she would order specific performance. You could have said, Judge, look here. We have secured financing. We have those funds available. We are ready to close on this contract tomorrow, uh, if only you would order that. Um, but I don't see anything like that in the record that suggests well, you guys well, are ready well, for. We're well, ready for I, specific I, I, performance. With all, all due respect, your honor, your honor the, the, the whole concept of, of us not being ready and willing was the argument of the appellee. The point is, is that you can't argue against the contract, and that's what they that was their whole dis discussion was is that the contract was not valid. You can't negate what the jury did. The jury heard the evidence. The jury knew what the, what the conspiracy and the tortious conduct of, of, of Mr. Arnold and Mr. Huggins. You can't argue that the, 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 the terms of the contract was not met, uh, whether my client was ready and willing. And she did indicate she was ready and willing, but that was again negated by her, by Mr. Huggins' lawyer that said she he wouldn't even meet with her. So, and as well as the fire that happened. So I'm saying, we cannot argue that that's relevant in the context of what they did. Now, if there was no conspiracy, there was no uh, tortious conduct, that, 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 that I would agree with the court that that would be an issue of whether we're re ready, willing, and able. But the, 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 the judge Van didn't even look at that. She didn't even focus on that. There was a technical problems I was having uh, with the pleadings. She never even argued whether or not th th that was relevant. She argued that the contract was not relevant. But that's not in the context of what was really happening. And you can't negate the, what the jury did. The jury was over looking at the same rule, the same facts. The judge concluded, Judge Macaluso concluded that was, it was a valid contract. We cannot come back and argue the contract was not valid because of the terms when she argued that the, the contract was and the jury found that it was. That would be different if those elements was not there. It would be different if it wasn't the, the tort and the conspiracy, or the issue with Judge Pan would have been that we would you be able to perform the contract? We never got an opportunity to even do that, but based on what she had concluded was uh, what was that issue was the, whether the contract 
and I think that's different from what the jury did with Judge Macaluso said. She can't argue later that the contract was not valid or we didn't have all the terms because that's be, that's uh, kind of negate what the, what the jury was doing and what Judge Macaluso doing. All these people for years have looked at what was going on in terms of the terms of the contract. And uh, my client had tried to deal with the contract. It was a fire. She had been paid, paid uh, Mr. Huggins' monies. He decided through the conspiracy that he wanted to get more money. And it's a greed thing there. And he wanted to go with Mr. Arnold went along with it. And it was based on that that we, they were able to conclude that we would go forward and, 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 and sell the property to Arnold and notwithstanding the terms, because they weren't even concerned about the terms, because they was engaged in a conspiracy. So what, what our position, Your Honor, is that the whole point is you cannot look behind what the judge, Macaluso, you cannot go behind with the verdict of the jury. The jury saw all the facts. The jury made the determination of what was going on. Now, when you say, will we be able to, uh, which Judge Pan never dealt with, and never even discussed, whether or not we would be ready, willing to, to, to deal with the, the contract. Hey, hey, counsel, let me, let me try an example. Let's say I agreed to sell you a car in 2010. Uh, let's call it a, a 1994 Buick Skylark. Uh, so I'm selling you a car in 2010, and I breached, and I decided to sell it to somebody else, causing you some damage. And five years later, you win a jury verdict saying, yes, I've damaged you. The car was a great deal. It cost you $5,000. And then there's a question of whether or not the trial court judge can order specific performance. One reason why the judge might not be able to is I don't have the car anymore. I've sold it to somebody else. Another reason, let's say it exploded. That car doesn't exist anymore. So the question of whether or not specific performance can be ordered because the parties are willing, capable, and able to carry out the envisioned performance is separate from whether or not they have a contract. And I don't, I still don't hear you answering that question, especially where Ms. Hudgens is not even a party to this suit at the time Judge Pan ruled. So how could she order her to carry out specific performance? Well, Hudgens was part of the suit at the, in, the, in the second bifurcated case. He was part of the suit. Judge Pan argued that he was not part of the suit. He testified in the case. He was willing, uh, in terms of the TOPA issues that the TOPA plaintiffs uh, argue. So she, she never she never argued and, and never concluded. That was one of the issues that we had. She never even concluded that that the, the, the terms of the contract uh, was not uh, was not valid. He, she, she just just arbitrarily said that based on the, adopting the terms that the uh, appellee argued, which argued their whole complete their whole pleadings was that the contract was not valid. And uh, you can't go with what the jury and everything else is saying that the contract is not valid because that's the terms you want to, 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 to argue when that's, as I said before, in total contrast with what the jury is. And with the judge, in other words, you're trying to say that they, you would have to conclude that the jury and Judge Macaluso was wrong, but the contract was valid. If it's valid, then you can't then go back to the fact that it was valid because of the term Pacific performance, but and, and and the other thought side of that is, Ruth Sinus has a right to some kind of remedy, and that's why I think the court, this court, has sent it back to uh, the, the trial judge to uh, the fashion whether or not she she can determine whether she is entitled to Pacific performance based on the fact of what had happened to her, and it cannot be from the point of view of, of the other side claim, claiming that the, the whole question of of a valid and a uh, uh, terms is different because that's a different look and a different focus on the question of specific performance. Specific Mr. performance Lawson. cannot be negated or con controlled contrary to what the jury and the, and the trial judge is saying. Mr. Lastly, um, yes, sir. let's accept for a moment, let's accept the jury verdict that the contract was valid. I okay. just want to be sure I understand something. Um, did the contract, do I understand correctly, that the contract required uh, Ms. Saunders to uh, essentially do four things or to do at least four things. It, it required her to assume the first or to be willing to assume the first mortgage. Is that right? Yeah, yes, yes, I think that's part of the and, and, it, and is it right that it required her to be, to be able and willing to pay the full second mortgage? Which she did. 
She did do that. She paid. Yes, yeah, she did. She 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 paid. She paid this, and this was during the time of the fire, when the, the, uh, Mr. Huggins had asked her to pay money, and to help in terms of the rehab of the of the of the of the building. What what she did was she continue to pay his mortgage, and continue to to pay did him. She pay, least, which, did she present evidence? Huh? The mortgage, I'm the sorry. second mortgage had not been paid in full, had it? No, because that's when Mr. Huggins sold the property to Mr. Arnold. Okay, so so if I understand correctly, I just want to be sure I have the facts here. Right. The the contract required her to pay in full the second mortgage in order to acquire the property. And am I correct that it also and and the, and the second mortgage as of yet has not been paid in full. I think. Uh, did the contract also require her? One, another condition was to pay the water bill. Is that right? She paid the water bill. And to pay Hudgens and his attorneys, is that right? Yes, and she and she made efforts to do that, and they because Mr. Hudgens. Well, the question in my mind is different. For those four okay. things, at the time of trial before Judge Pan, those four things had yet to be completed. They may have she may have started on them, but they had yet to be completed. Did she present evidence that she was ready, willing, and able? To do those, to do those four things completely and fully. Yes, yeah, she was willing. Yes, yeah, she, she, what she said, and what, what and what I'm saying. What that was, was that, that evidence? That well, no, what, Your Honor, what, what, what she said, and what the whole issue in the case was. Judge Pan adopted the argument, the mistakenly argument that she, that she didn't file the appropriate pleadings. Well, I'm not asking have, about that. I understand that you object to Judge Pan's ruling there. But in the alternative, she said, even if I get the get to the merits, uh, she, you would not prevail. And I just want to understand, are you claiming there was evidence in the record before Judge Pan that Ms. Saunders was, at that time, ready, willing, and able to assume the first mortgage, pay off and fold the second mortgage, pay, pay off and fold the water bill, and pay Mr. Hudgens and his attorneys. I don't know what that money amounts to. Uh, yeah, she was she was willing to do that. You the, say the that, point, what I'd like to know is what was the evidence in the record that she was ready, willing, and able to, to, to do, do those things? Not just well, willing, but ready and able to do them. Well, she, she the, the point is, Your Honor, is that you, you, the, 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 the question is out of context of what was going on. Miss, Miss, uh, what what Mr. Ms. Ron, Ms. Saunders was attempting to do was to receive specific performance. But the point is, when we when she made an effort, I, mean, I would think what she's got to do is she's got to come into court and say, I either have the cash in hand because I have a big bank account, or I've got the finance and here it is, or you know. She you know, she, she filed she filed. And I'd like to know before. if she put in that kind of evidence. She well, there was evidence in the case. None of those evidence even got to Judge Pan. But I'm saying before that, and Judge Macaluso and the pleadings in the cases and, and the stuff we had filed, she had made efforts and obtained loans and uh, had sent a, a letter to Huggins' letter to his lawyer for that lawyer for her, for her to pay the $30,000. And that's in addition to the $10,000 she paid for in the interim period. And Mr. <laughs> Mr. Huggins had agreed to that before he decided to sell the property to Mr. Arnold. So Mr. This, this, Russell, this, yes, yes ma'am. There was a conversation at the hearing, um, sorry, in 2018, um, it's in the joint appendix um, around um, 600, just before, just around there, where, where the court is asking actually if she's limited to the record from the trial. Right, and what what was your response to that? Because I'm, it seems I'm sorry, like God, I didn't you, understand that. So, as far as I can understand, it sounds like Appellee's counsel was arguing to Judge Pan that the issue of specific performance had been fully litigated at trial, and the court just hadn't made findings on that. And so Judge Pan specifically asked you to respond to whether I'm confined to the record before Judge Macaluso or whether additional evidence can be presented. 
that's I, it. That's at page supplemental appendix 602. What what was your did you did you argue yes I should be able to present specific evidence and here it is? Well, or yes, I, I argued. I argued that was at the, at her hearing. I did argue that that she is she is uh, bound by the decisions of the jury and Judge Macaluso. And I I was I did, but sorry, let me make to, to, again making this this distinction that Judge Deal was making between evidence that there was a contract, right? Uh, yes, and evidence that shows that your client is ready, willing, and able to perform the terms of the, the contract. And it sounds like what Appellee's counsel was arguing before Judge Pan is, all of that evidence was presented at trial. You shouldn't look at what the current circumstances are. Well, well the, the circumstances did, did not change. The circumstances were the change was the same as what what the, the, the verdict the verdict and what Judge Macaluso argued. That what, that might be true. That might be true as a matter of fact, but I'm wondering whether there needed to be some proof of that, right? I mean, your ability to make a down payment, to have financing, right? I mean, banks don't extend offers to pay mortgages for an unlimited amount of time, right? They usually say, here, we'll finance you at this rate and you have to close within this period of time. Well, that, um, no, no, and no, so no. the fact that she was ready, willing, and able to perform at the time of trial might not be dispositive of her ability to perform at the time you're back in front of Judge Pan. Well, right? we, we were, we were uh, 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 initially, and what we, we thought, the Pellinock thought, that we were there to see what, in fact, would be decided in reference to what was happening at the, with, in the jury case and what the Judge Macaluso ruled. You, you, I, I don't think there's any issue at all in reference to what, what may have happened to their arguments. I don't think that at all follows anything. Okay, so well, I, let's hear, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go, ahead, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, we'll give you a few minutes in rebuttal. Let us hear from uh, counsel for the appellees. Um, all right, thank you. And let me ask, I gather there are, are there two appellees before us now? That's right, Your Honor. And uh, have you dis discussed among yourselves how you want to uh, divide up your time? I'll take the first 10 minutes, Your Honor. Ms. Alexander will take the second five. Very good. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Russo, go ahead. May it please the court, Michael Russo on behalf of Defendant Arnold. Uh, there are two aspects of this uh, brief appeal that need to be addressed. The substantive issues uh, were addressed on <clears throat> Mr. Lasley's uh, argument. I do want to just touch or raise the fact that procedurally, this case, uh, it puts us at a distinct disadvantage in that the brief is devoid of any of the formalities, but most importantly, devoid of citation to the record. Uh, there are two paragraphs in Mr. Lastly's brief that refer to a record or any evidence. Those are paragraphs 20 and 21. And it should be noted that those paragraphs refer to the brief that Mr. Lastly submitted to Judge Pan that Judge Pan rejected. But are, in you, are you sure this is this is where you want to start your argument that his brief is devoid of citations to the record? I just want what I do want to point out is that the record that is cited is not the record before the court. It's an I, I appreciate that, and then that is that is very much intertwined with the first issue that he, with the first uh, argument that he makes, which I take to be, you know, on October sixteenth, he filed a brief with the trial court, and you know, clearly had some technical issues, and for the trial court then to strike it and not consider it uh, seems a bit draconian. Of you know, everybody seemed to have it. You know, it's in the record. No, the trial court had it. I, I, I think. It was electronically filed, or at least it went through the case file express. Um, so I'm not sure what happened, but it, it seems, pretty it seems pretty severe to me 
uh, to his client that if he had technical issues that precluded him from understanding that his brief hadn't been filed, that you're going to end up dismissing uh, a, a obviously meritorious uh, a case that at one point had won a jury trial. Judge, the sole point I'm trying to make is that the only citation in the in the uh, Apple appellant's presentation to this court is not a citation to the record. It's a citation to a deposition that was right. not offered and as part of the record. Counsel, did you move to strike his brief? The court did that so sponte. Oh, yes, the, the Smith, we, we moved in this oh, case. In this, in this court, system. right? I mean, yeah. it's, it seems we're here. And, okay. and the brief is here, and it seems water under the bridge. So can, could we go back to where I was with Mr. Lasley um, during his argument? You know, the, at least at this point in the transcript, it's Supplemental Appendix 605, the court says I, that she thinks that she should only look at the record that was before Judge Macaluso. Um, and not look at any new evidence as far as specific performance? I think that was the court's, this court's mandate on remand. The court- So, uh, so you're, you think it was correct for Judge Pan to say, I sh shouldn't consider whether um, Mr. Lasley's client has the current ability to specifically perform. I just should look to see whether there was evidence at the trial that established that she could specifically perform. And if so, then she could elect between the damages and the specific performance, but her current ability to specifically perform was legally irrelevant. Do you, th do you think that that's correct? I believe it is contrary to the court's mandate. I do believe the court instructed Judge Pan to consider evidence previously submitted. What, what did you argue before Judge Pan? Did you, did you say, hey, we want to know whether she can specifically perform right now? No, we argued the record before Judge Pan. And what and did you argue, no what did you argue in your brief on appeal to us? We argued in our, on our brief to appeal that uh, she was not, there was no, there was no certain contract and that she wasn't ready, willing, and able to perform at any point prior to the trial. But what about right now? You don't. You still don't. You don't think. Did not, it's... Did not argue that. Did not argue that issue. Is, isn't that the relevant question for specific performance? Going back to my Buick Skylark example, uh, whether or not I was ready, willing, able to perform at the time of the breach, uh, or the other party was, seems totally irrelevant to whether or not you can order specific performance which would seem to hinge on whether or not they could perform it now, if ordered. Doesn't that, doesn't that seem like what we consider or what the trial court should have considered when deciding whether or not to order specific performance? Well, if that is the case, there was no attempt to, to offer testimony to the court that Judge Pan, when Judge Pan was arguing. Well, I think what Judge Easterly is saying that you cut it off at the legs. Uh, the judge pan cut it off at the legs because she said, I'm limited to looking at the pre-trial evidence, which seems plainly wrong to me. Now, Mr. Lasley doesn't raise this point, um, but I think it's pretty clearly wrong. Um, and I don't know why a trial court, when deciding whether or not to order specific performance, would preoccupy themselves with a time in the past as opposed to their present ability to perform. I don't, I don't understand why that would be true. Well, it's, an, it's an, an issue that was not preserved for appeal. There was no attempt or request to offer new testimony. The briefs that were filed did not present any new testimony, did not ask to present new testimony to the court. The briefs were presented, count parties appeared for, ultimately appeared for oral argument and argued it. Uh, when who's, who's, whose burden is it to establish? You know who has the burden of establishing the propriety of specific performance? It is the burden is on the burden is on the plaintiff to to provide to show that the plaintiff had a certain contract and that they were ready, willing, and able to perform that contract and ready, willing, and able to perform it within a reasonable period of time. 
So, and I think Mr. Lastly at, at uh, the supplemental appendix 602 was specifically asked whether it was limited to the record to which he responded, well, what they just presented to you is what they claimed their interpretation of the jury verdict. What was before Judge Macaluso was the jury verdict, as well as her rulings in reference to certain aspects of the defendant's claims. He does not ask to present new testimony. The, so uh, while that may be an argument, it's not one argued by the app appellant or preserved on appeal. The evidence that we have is that the contracts that are for which they seek specific performance are not certain, not sufficiently what, what, certain. I want to talk about that for a second. What are what are the differences between the two contracts aside from the hundred seventy thousand and the hundred fifty three thousand term? Um, which you know, I feel like when appellant says we're happy to go with the higher price term, you might you might lose any complaint to the uncertainty of the terms. What else is there? What are the other differences? Well, the the differences are a function of both contracts apparently are offered as attachments to the settlement agreement, and the settlement agreement have alternative terms. But when you when you boil it down to whether a contract is enforceable for specific performance, you have to know what the terms are that you're going to specifically enforce. It's not for the judge to make those inquiries. And I think this is where Stanford Hotels, which we cited, comes in. And it refers to Judge Lavelle, the Southern District of New York's opinion, where they identify a type one contract and a type two contract. The type one contract is a contract that is complete in all essential terms, subject to negotiation and, and committal to writing, and negotiating on some of this other uh, details. That contract is specifically enforceable. A type two contract is basically a commitment to continue to negotiate essential terms of the contract. You're saying, believe, you're saying it was a term sheet. I mean, you, you basically had an agreement to further hammer out the terms later. Well, it is an, a type two contract is an enforceable contract. And we argue that that is the contract the jury enforced and entered damages for because the Mr. Arnold was held to have interfered with the ability from that contract to go from an agreement to agree to a final committed agreement. Because of that interference by Mr. Arnold and Mr. Hudgens, the argument, our argument is, it never became a stage two contract, which could. So, be so, so, but my simple question that so I was as I was asking about the differences between the hundred seventy three, the hundred seventy thousand term sheet, and hundred fifty three thousand uh, dollars. But let's let me go more directly at your current position, which is what terms were left to be decided under what you're referring to as a type two agreement to further negotiate. What what was left outstanding under the contract that the jury found? How much to pay? Okay, and when the only options are 170 and 153, and appellant says we're we're the purchaser, we'll, we'll take the higher price. It doesn't seem like you're in much of a position to complain about that. Was there anything else as to the certainty of the contract? Yeah. Uh, no, there's nothing else but the term of that okay. amount. The, she at one point, Ms. Saunders concedes in her jury, in her trial testimony at SA uh, 298 that she decided not to go forward. This is confirmed in her trial testimony, which wasn't offered. I apologize as part of the uh, as part of the supplemental appendix at 285, 286, the trial pages. She said she wasn't going forward. Then later on, she decided to revive, unilaterally revive her contract to go forward. And that sounds like uh, an argument you should have made to the jury. I mean, that sounds like a breach. That is an argument that was made. That, that was didn't, made it, didn't, below. It didn't go over so well for you, though, right? Well, whether it. It, it, it seems carried, difficult to make that argument now that the Court of Appeals has said we need to figure out 
whether or not she's entitled to specific performance. I mean, if, if it were really established that she had abandoned efforts to buy this property, I don't think we would have issued an opinion saying, go and do more work to, to figure out specific performance. To determine whether there was a contract in place, and that is the, the first element of a specific performance evaluation. So I do right. think it, it, is, it is important to the analysis. Uh, in uh, my time is my time is near. Uh, with respect to the conspiracy argument, I'll only say, when specifically asked at SA six sixty seven, for Mr. Lastly to cite to evidence or proffer evidence as to why the conspiracy prevented the appellant from actually conducting uh, from performing the contract. He was not able to cite any specific evidence of that. And when specifically asked to cite evidence of uh, ready, willing, and able, he conceded that she made efforts. That was as far as they went. Your Honor, I uh, cede the rest of my time to Ms. Alexander. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, Your Honor. Ms. Alexander, go ahead. Wendy Alexander on behalf of Apelli uh, US Bank. Um, Obviously, most of our uh, position is similar to that of Eppoli, uh, Mr. Arnold. Um, and, you know, as far as a couple of the points that you've raised as to whether we should be looking at specific performance and her ability, Ms. Saunders' ability to perform now, you know, obviously, again, the Judge Pan determined not to take evidence on that issue, but the facts on the ground, so to speak, have changed. That property is no longer, you know, held by that same Chase, uh, you know, mortgage that uh, the, the uh, you know, trial took testimony on as to whether she had assumed the mortgage first or second. So you know, you're know you gonna be looking at an entirely different set of facts if the court were to ever say, this is the analysis we, we need to have. Judge Pan certainly didn't feel like she needed that analysis and went back to the trial court record and decided that Ms. Saunders was not entitled to the specific performance she had requested for multiple reasons. One, the procedural briefing that the court does not want to hear any more about. Second, uh, the issues with uh, the definite terms being lacking. And of course, that is one of the elements that is required before an award of specific performance. And then do you, do you want to take a crack at what definite terms were lacking? Was, was it just 170 or 153? And, and Your Honor, I apologize. I did not participate in the trial proceedings, only coming in at the Court of Appeals level. I believe what Mr. Rousseau has stated is accurate as far as the, the difference between two short form contracts. So don't, don't you think that's a pretty funny ruling or a pretty funny argument? If somebody says, look, uh, we, we signed two contracts. One was I buy your car for 10,000. One was I buy your car for 11,000. And then we go into, and I say, I want specific performance. I'm happy to pay the 11,000. You say, ah, oh, but it might be 10. So therefore don't order specific performance. Um, I'm willing to pay most of the higher number. It, it's, it's a funny reason not to order specific performance. Performance well, that maybe I, I owe even less. You, it just doesn't seem like you have standing to complain about it. But again, that is not the 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 current facts on the ground, or you know, the current standing of that property is not as it was back in two thousand and three when her initial contract was entered into, or both of those short form contracts. So we're not looking at the same terms anymore. Uh, you know, again, those four things that uh, uh, Judge. Um, Glickman was asking about the water bill, the attorney's fee payment, uh, the assum assumption of the first mortgage and the you know, payment in full on the second. You know, none of those terms now are, would be the same if the court you know, required us to look at whether she was ready, willing, and able to perform those things. That It wouldn't be the same analysis. If, so I, if I remember the, the terms would be the same or none of the facts going none, to None of the facts with respect to that analysis would be the right. same. Right, we don't, we, we don't have a record as to what the current situation is. And, and again, I, I read the mandate as this, you know, the same as Mr. Rousseau, which is that go determine whether specific performance is warranted there was a, you know, a however many day jury trial on that issue, um, and the 
court, you know, on remand looked at that trial testimony significantly and determined, made that legal analysis, deter, you know, determination as to whether there were definite terms and determined, no, there, you know, there, there were not. That is within her sound discretion to make that ruling. And I don't think there has been a claim that there has been a clearly erroneous finding in that regard. Similarly, I don't think- I guess the way is I that a factual it. finding? I mean, is that a factual- that I, I, that, that I think sounds that it, like a legal determination that there aren't definite terms to a contract. I think she made factual findings that she was not ready, willing, and able to, to go to closing. That, I believe, is a factual finding. And I, I do think that the uh, finding on uh, the no definite terms, um, you know, and the I don't know that she went any further on that legal analysis track than the, than the no definite terms. Um, but, that, you know, again, if she reaches that point and that finding... She has made a determination at this point that that she that Ms. Saunders has not met the legal burden to uh, move forward with a grant of specific performance, and I don't think that that has been shown to be clearly erroneous. Um, the as Mr. Rousseau cited, I believe in the record at SA 653 and 6, 654. Again, this is Judge Pan really delving into the record. She says, "I do see some efforts to become ready, willing, and able, but not." ever the full ready, willing, you know, and able uh, requirement to be able to, for me to grant, you know, specific performance. Um, so she went into the, the trial record at great, you know, at great lengths um, and, and asked about the um, assumption of the mortgage, asked about the uh, payment of partial attorney's fees, but not all. You know, she, she went into and revisited the trial testimony on those issues, which is assuming, you know, she assumed that that was what this court wanted as, as a result of its uh, mandate to her. Um, and again, we posit that none of those findings have been shown to be clearly erroneous. Um, and, you know, under CF Independent Management Company versus Summers, uh, you know, the Court of Appeals should be, should be bound to those determinations. Um, and, uh, you know, there were other findings as well by uh, Judge Pan, which was the seller of the property, Stephen Hudgens, was not before the court due to a bankruptcy stay. I don't know if the court has any questions on that finding as well. Uh, but there were, you know, there were multiple reasons given for the overall substantive ruling um, um, denying Ms. Saunders' request for specific performance. And we don't think that any of them should be overturned on, on, a, on appeal. Ms. We, Alexander, certainly. I want to try to wrap my mind a little bit around the right way to think of this legally. I'm thinking that perhaps the way this should have been looked at is as follows. A record was made at the initial trial on which Judge Macaluso at the time should have determined whether um, uh, Ms. Saunders was uh, entitled, if she wanted it, to the remedy of specific performance. And if that record supported that, Judge Macaluso would have said, okay, you have your choice now. You can take the $40,000 breach uh, damages, monetary damages for the tortious interference, um, or I, uh, I will order um, enter a judgment granting you specific performance. Now, when we remanded, I think we were asking Judge Pan to make that determination and choice would then be based on that record. But I would think that the because if, because if Miss because if Miss um, Sanders was no longer able to perform, then she would simply choose the damages remedy instead of specific performance. But I would think that if anybody was going to raise change circumstances, it would be the it would be either Mr. Arnold or the bank. I guess Mr. S Mr. Hudgens was not participating. Um, does that sound right to you? And if that's true, my question is, did Mr. Arnold or the bank raise uh, the objection that, well, things aren't now what they were then, and there's no point in ordering specific, it, there's no point in granting a remedy of specific performance now if it's simply impossible to to carry out. You see what I'm saying? I, 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 I may do, not I, understand the law here well enough. No, I do, Your Honor. And I do think that at the December 3rd, 2018 hearing, the issue of whether new 
items of evidence uh, you know, should be entertained or whether Judge Pan was going to be limited to the record. There was a brief discussion on that. And at, you know, again, it was determined that she was going to be reviewing the record and that was all. Um, and, do, and let me just interrupt you if I may. Yep. Uh, are you saying that neither, neither, there are three parties, no party um, uh, asked Judge Pan to consider um, new evidence beyond the record of the first trial? Appelli certainly did not. And I believe Mr. Lasley was trying to get the court to entertain uh, so potentially some additional information. And the court said, I believe- What, what, addition, what additional information was I, Mr. Lasley trying to get the court? Do, I, I, don't know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Your Honor. I don't know. Mr. Lasley can tell us on rebuttal. Okay. And if, if your honors don't have any more questions, uh, you know, our position is that the court needs to affirm Judge Pan's uh, entry of the uh, re-entry of the 2012 original order with respect to judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lasley, you have a few minutes for rebuttal. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that the, the most important point is, is what Judge Pan uh, ordered is that she was gonna follow what Judge Macaluso said. That's her main order in June 7th, uh, I think, uh, 2019. I'm not certain of the date. But she she did not do a, a, a separate this, this, uh, uh, opinion or reasoning of what the mandated issue in terms of what the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Sonners, the, the appellant, could be arguing for. So th this argument from the, the appellee that uh, about the, the, the terms and stuff, none of those things were even discussed. So one of the things that we argue, and one of the things we, we, we would ask the court to seriously consider, that you cannot argue about the, the, the terms of the contract out of context of why the contract was not uh, fulfilled. So- uh, Mr. Lasley, I, I, I get that. Um, one question is whether on the record that was created before Judge Macaluso, yes, the sir. evidence the evidence showed that at that time, Ms. Saunders was ready, willing, and able to perform. Um, th the other question is at the at the proceedings on remand before Judge Pan, did you or any party ask Ms. Pan ask Judge Pan to go? Beyond the record of the create of the trial, of the previous trial, and enter and receive additional evidence. Well, what, either uh, of current circumstances or anything else. Un unfortunately, uh, well, just answer my question. I I'm wanna, sorry. I'm a slow thinker, so I want to go through okay. this step. Go by ahead. Step. I'm, I am too, so don't worry so, about it. <laughs> Right, well, we're the slow thinker society. It's a good society. So just, just tell me. I'm sorry, go ahead. Did, any, please, please, did please. anybody on in the proceedings on remand ask Judge Pan to uh, receive additional evidence beyond what was presented in the trial before Judge Macaluso? Uh, my recollection, Your Honor, has been several years, but my recollection is that when I came before Judge Pan, I made an attempt to highlight what what, what the the appellant's appellee was trying to say. I think what, what was said and what Judge Pan focused on was was the whole thing. She dictated the, the, that uh, that all, that uh, hearing. And in that hearing, she focused on what the, the appellee had said. So it was no real effort, uh, opportunity to go into details or ask that she never really asked any questions about that. And what we had argued, what we had simply argued, Your Honor, is that the focus is on why Ruth Silence was unable to perform at the time that these conspiracies and torture interference had occurred. And those we argued those two things cannot be separated by arguing the terms of the contract. And, and, and understand in a bif bifurcated case, Judge Macaluso had made a decision that, that we could have had specific performance, 
but that we had selected to, to, to take the money down. We didn't select that. That was the case. That was how the trial, the second trial came about. Refresh my memory. Back when the yeah. case was before Judge Macaluso. Yes, sir. After the jury um, uh, awarded uh, monetary damages, was it contemplated that there would be the further presentation of evidence before Judge Macaluso on the question of specific performance? Or was it understood that Judge Macaluso would then decide on that record whether there would be? No, she, 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 she had said that she would consider the, the, the specific performance re request based on in the context of what the Tolbert plaintiffs were also saying. So she, she had made statements that she had, she had ruled, she was uh, pertinent to ruling, uh, considered ruling based on what the, uh, the Topa plaintiffs were saying and based on what the jury had said about Mr. Arnold, that in terms of uh, Ruth Saunders, that's when she decided at, at, the, at the trial for Judge McAluce that she decided that she would consider specific performance in the context that that's how Ruth Saunders and, and the Topa plaintiffs could, rule, could, could decide based on her rulings what, what, what was whatever kind of damage is already. And that's the whole thing about damages under, under, the, under what the appellate is saying that Ruth Saunders is not entitled to any kind of remedy. And what the what the, the mandate said that she he she could could argue for a mandate would argue that she could have specific performance if their circumstances support that. And what we maintain throughout all these trials and, and motions is that Ruth Saunders and rely can rely on the, the the wisdom of the verdict and the jury who saw the evidence who focused on the case. And you can't you can't negate that her right to a remedy, which they and 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 the Pelly's uh, Pelly's counsel said they don't know where Arnold was. There was no opportunity to to to, to ask Arnold to do anything because they don't. They said that at the last hearing before this court, she, he said he didn't know where where he was, and 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 and, and, and they had not and Ruth Sanders had not got any monies from him. So the bottom line is. I think this court is uh, maybe on the first impression. You can't rely on on, on specific forms in the, in, the, in the abstract. This court has to make a decision on what what can be done in situations where the uh, one of the parties has really destroyed it, destroyed destroyed rather the ability of the other party to perform, and then uh, and then try to come back and argue that the, the party didn't uh, perform because of the, the circumstances. Of the of the tort or the conspiracy, uh, we maintain that that's the key issue here. Is that Judge Pan never addressed that? And the counsel, at, uh, uh, the court asked whether or not uh, she could have done specific performance. She tried to do specific performance even before the case even sent to Judge Malacco. The, the, the first trial was even uh, decided, but the decision and findings of the first court and what Judge uh, Macaluso and her order and opinion focuses on, on those factors. And we would only argue to this court that uh, maybe it's new law, maybe it's new law, new principle. That the, the bottom line is you cannot negate uh, a, a, a party can have any remedy whatsoever. And, and, and she has a right to try to elect that with the evidence. And I don't think it'd be relied to the circumstances of the terms of the contract and whether or not the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ms. Saunders was able to perform in the abstract. It has to be within the context of what the jury said. The jury said what Judge okay, Macaluso said. Okay, this is the last thing. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think we have your argument. And okay. um, uh, your time has expired. Oh, well, well uh, I think always... we have, there's, there's always more time. I, I, <laughs> yeah, well, I thank you we very much. Time. Thank you for your indulgence. Okay, and, and uh, we will take the case. The case is now submitted, uh, and I can excuse um, all counsel. You may uh, log off. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> all right, let's see it.
We'll call the third case now. This is um, American Studies Association versus Bronner et al. Council. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Tom McGavro. I'm here on behalf with I'm here with Maria LaHood and Mark Kleiman on behalf of the appellants. If I may, Your Honor, we'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. I would also yield uh, three minutes of my time to Ms. LaHood and two minutes to Mr. Kleiman, leaving me, I believe, with seven minutes. My math is accurate. I know that's I a little confusing. I think I it may not. I, I, well, we'll find out if it's accurate or not. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honors. Again, may it please the court, my name is Tom McGavro. I am here for most of the appellants. I won't take the time to list them all. Your Honors, this case is uh, part of a nationwide campaign to, to suppress the critics of the Israeli government and the supporters of the BDS movement. This case, Ms. Ms. LaHood will speak more specifically as to this, but this case arises entirely out of the 2013 adoption of the academic resolution. That is, and I don't think there could be any question about it, that is an act in furtherance of public advocacy on a matter of public interest. We, the, the appellants here, the defendants below, have demonstrated the prima facie showing for the uh, required under the anti slap Act. And as so this court I, has- I would have thought that you wanted to argue that this doesn't have anything to do with speech, right? That your claims are about that the claims at issue are actually uh, about um, corporate control of of the ASA, right? I, and that violations of the bylaws and breach of fiduciary duty, and I, and that the speech that occurs in this case is downstream from that. I, no, Your Honor, that's the appellee's position, I believe. Uh, and they have they have said that in the Superior Court. I think they said that in their briefs. They may very well say it today. I don't think it is credible. Um, this uh, why not? Well, right? I mean, we have we have a complaint that has claims for breach. There's no defamation claim. There's no, no. you know false light claim. There's no claim of intentional inflection of emotional distress about anything that is said. Everything goes to what's happening internally within this organization. And ultimately, people are unhappy about a resolution that is passed by the organization as reconstituted with new leadership. But the claims are not about the speech. The claims are about um, the what what the plaintiffs below thought was the co-opting of this organization. Except, Your Honor, that the quote co-opting of the organization unquote is only alleged to have occurred by people with a particular viewpoint. But they, let's they, focus on the statute, right? This, yes, so Your Honor. 5501 defines what an act in furtherance of a right of advocacy on issues of public interest means. Right. 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 Yes. Any written or oral statement, yes. right? The claims don't have anything to do with a written oral statement. The claims have to do with breach of fiduciary duty, breach, of, right? Like if we're looking at I, the claims as pled under the, the counts of the complaint. Your right. Honor, I, I have to disagree. Uh, I think the, the, the claims all have to do with the actual speech, with the content of the speech. Well, can you point me to the complaint and the claims raised? The, well, right. Your Honor. Because I'm looking the, at the complaint. Yes, and, and the, I mean. I mean, maybe you're going to point me to the facts, but I'm, well, looking, at, I'm looking at the claims. I think count unless you, you think claims mean something different under the the no, slap act. No, Your Honor, I'm looking. I'm looking at the counts of the complaint. Okay. And breach. breach point, count point one. Me where you want me to look? Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, uh, I, I I would have to scroll through, but the we're looking at the the unredacted complaint, and that is going to be. Um, I'm, I'm, forgive me. I am scrolling as we talk. Um, it's a long complaint. It is a long complaint. 
Uh, and while I'm getting there, okay, count one is at uh, uh, page 96 of the joint appendix. That's what, that's what we'll start. Breach of fiduciary duty. They didn't, the, the, the defendants did not tell anybody that they supported BDS when they were running for, when they were running for office. And they, they used their platform to pass a resolution which, God knows, everybody should have figured out was a bad idea because it's pro-Palestinian. You, you, you can't argue with that. Plus, they then used funds to, divide, to defend a pro-Palestinian resolution. Now, I would point out, Your Honor, that the, a, the ASA has passed numerous resolutions on various topics. They okay, don't- I'm sorry, but let me just, it's breach of fiduciary duty against the individual plaintiff, defendants. Yes. And it's material misrepresentations and omissions in connection with elections to office and seeking member approval. Right. These are internal communications, right? So I get that you, you know, it's, it, you wanna say it's speech, right? It's about speech. But under yes. 165501, an act in furtherance of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest means a written or oral statement in connection with an issue under consideration or review by a legislative, executive, or judicial body, none of which applies to ASA, this one. right, or any other official proceeding authorized by law, or in a place open to the public or a public forum in connection with an issue of public interest, again, not the ASA, um, not, the, not the internal elections of the I, ASA. Or would again, you think, do you think, I, that the, you think the election process within the ASA is a public forum? Your Honor, first, I think that the, the, the campaign statements, if we're looking solely at count one, the campaign statements certainly are a public forum because they are broadcast to the entire membership. Plus, this is not just, you know, within the it's national a private organization no it, it, it with thousands of members um plus your honor i would stress again support for that i that's a, that, i mean that's just an interesting thought that the asa we, is a public forum and i'm wondering what support you have for that because that uh, doesn't your, strike me as what i think of a public forum as but maybe i'm maybe i'm um you know ignorant of the full scope of that term i, I think your honor Two points, if I may. First of all, the resolution, everything stems from the passage of the resolution. I'm, I, I don't want to go to the resolution right now. I really want to stick to the material misrepresentation, misrepresentations and omissions in connection with the elections to the ASA. Uh, and you okay. think that those are public statements, and I'm wondering if you have any support. And so, I mean, maybe you do, or maybe you just think that's the right answer. I, I one, think it would be interesting for me to hear, but I, I'd like an answer to that question. Certainly, Your Honor. I think the, 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 the campaign statements, again, they were posted uh, to the membership at large, which meant they were, they were broadcast to a large section of the population. Okay, a I'm, section I'm of the population. hearing from you that you would like that to be the right answer, but you don't actually have any support for that position. I do not have uh, case law support for that position. No, okay. Your Honor, I Thank do you. not. Uh, and uh, Mr. I'm Mugano, afraid, Mr. Mugano, if I may yes, leave in here, I just want to be sure. My understanding has been that there is one and only one uh, thing that has been treated in this litigation as an act in furtherance of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest within the meaning of the anti slap Act. And that thing that act is the resolution itself, not any other communications statement, um, <laughs> whatever expression um, that, that may have occurred in the, in the history of this case. And so the issue for us, if that is true, is whether, um, the any, whether, whether any of the claims uh, asserted by the plaintiffs in this case, quote, arise from, quote, the resolution. Is that a correct statement in your view? Um, uh, not, not entirely. If I may nuance it a little bit, Your Honor. And I, I would say I'm getting into Ms. LaHood's the only area issue, here. But the only issue as to the first prompt of the ASA. Well, yeah, no. I think there are two points to this. Certainly, 
So, I, I don't mean I don't mean to interrupt, but can you tell us the areas that the three of you are going to touch on so we know where to direct our questions? Because I don't think we've heard that yet. No, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I was I was going to talk about the, the second prong, whether or not the plaintiffs have met their burden. Ms. LaHood was going to talk about the first. I I I but I can certainly I can certainly speak to to, to Judge Glickman's question. Your Honor, I think certainly the academic resolution was the genesis of the entire lawsuit. That is the the the, the keystone. If, if that resolution had not been adopted, this lawsuit would not have happened. They would not have brought any of the other claims because they wouldn't care. I just wanted to go back to the statute to say, the statute doesn't say if the genesis of the lawsuit is speech, then you can bring an anti-slap uh, motion to dismiss. The statute says that if there's a claim that arises from an act in furtherance of a right of advocacy on the issues of public interest, right, then you can right. file a motion to just special motion to dismiss under the Anti-Slap Act. And it seems to me that the claims arise from sort of basic corporate governance, nonprofit governance issues, and the speech is downstream from that. And I, I understand that you disagree, but that's, I'm just in interest of full disclosure. That's how I read the statute. And maybe Ms. LaHood can talk about that in a few, I, I've been talking over my colleagues, so I'll let them ask you other questions, but uh, you don't have to respond to me at the moment. Uh, th thank you. I actually, to get back to uh, Judge Glickman, the second part of Judge Glickman's question, certainly had there not been the, uh, the academic resolution, this case would not have been filed and they never would have filed any of the claims. However, there is an other element to this, and that is that the plaintiffs have not sued any of the members of the National Council that did not profess uh, pro-BDS sentiments, which means so, that- So what? I mean, they can sue whoever they want to. Why does that yes, make Honor, more of an anti-slap than not? But now we're getting to the what an anti-slap or what a slap suit is. They have chosen the defendants who disagree with them and they're dragging them into this case and they are making them suffer this lawsuit, not because they care about the corporate governance, because let's face it, they didn't raise any, any, any uh, objections to the, the resolution in uh, opposing the North Carolina bathroom ban, the resolution on uh, a minimum wage uh, hike, the, the resolution on apartheid in South Africa. They didn't, they, that's below their radar. It's the pro BDS resolution that drew but, their ire and I mean, that dragged everybody into this lawsuit. What I hear you saying, counsel, is that you take a rather broad view of what the phrase arises from in the statute um, entails. That you think if its factual genesis was a speech act, then a suit arises from that speech act. And I suppose I'm just wondering if you can articulate for me what you think arises from means. Your Honor, I, I think arises from is either, and, and this may be somewhat generalized, but either it is a, where the factual genesis for the lawsuit, where the imp factual impetus for the, for the lawsuit is some speech and um, some act in the furtherance of the right of advocacy on a matter of public interest. It could also be where the thrust of the litigation is to, con is to, to uh, oppose and to contest a specific act in furtherance of advocacy. So, so these, these are pretty malleable tests that, you know, get us a little bit nervous when we announce well, that. that, that but I have, I, have a, I have two questions. One, okay. can you point me to the strongest case that you have for that proposition? It doesn't need to be in DC. Uh, you can point me to any case that interprets an arising from in a similar statute in a similar way okay. to what you're proposing. And second, uh, if that's your proposal, do you want to make an argument as to why it's a good one? a good interpretation of the anti-slap. Yes, and, and I'll take the second part first, if I may. Um, anti-slap is meant, is intended to protect the right of speech in public forms. 
it is intended to give the defendants who have made a public profession of some kind protection against slap suits, strategic lawsuits against public participation. In other words, and this court has said that numerous times, the, the act is a substantive right to go out and, 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 and speak in the public forum without having to worry about going through years of litigation. You do not want to endanger that right by taking too narrow a view of arising out of because clever litigants can write lawsuits that are slap suits that nonetheless shave the edges. And you don't want to get in a position where the only slap suit that this court will recognize is a defamation case or a false light case or an intentional reflection of emotional distress case and leave it to clever litigant, clever plaintiffs to bring more mundane breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty claims as slap suits and get away with it. Okay, so, so I take your argument is that with, if we don't adopt a, a robust version of arises from, uh, plaintiffs can smuggle in suits that are targeted at speech under the guise of some other umbrella, breach of contract, intentional inflection of emotional distress. And then right. do you wanna answer the first part of my question? Do you have a, a case that you think is the most helpful to you on that point? Most compelling on that point, Your Honor, um, on any number of the, the cases that we cited from the California jurisdictions, they have, I will, I will say they have a broader view of, of anti-slap. But um, I think the, the, certainly the one that strikes to, comes to mind is the Hasemovich versus Encino School Parent Teacher Organization. That's at uh, 203 Calap 4th 450. Given um, your concession that California statute is broader definitionally than ours, do you have any other authority from a jurisdiction that has a, a statute more akin to ours? Um, the, well, the California statute, although it is somewhat, it is interpreted broader, it, the, nonetheless, that has uh, similar points and the Hasemovich case does, does it define, it. does it define an act of furtherance in the right uh, of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest in the same way that we do? Um, if for that particular case, it, it, it does not deal with some of the differences between the statutes. California does allow any slap when it, the, the, the case arises out of a ongoing litigation, which I don't think the, the DC court, DC statute does not, but that Hasemovich does not involve that particular distinction. The Hasemovich, again, the case was whether or not, uh, was, was, was statements about a high school coach uh, and even though the claims were, were mainly breach of contract and, and uh, uh, the acts of the school board, it nonetheless fell with an anti-slap. I have taken far more time than I need. If I may touch briefly on the point that I was- Yes, trusting. you may. I was going to ask you to do that. I have, like everybody else, I suppose, follow-up questions. I'll save them for Ms. LaHood. Thank you. Uh, uh, so get ready, Ms. LaHood. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but Mr. Mugabaro, I take it you want to speak to the second prong, the defendant's I, failure, I take it you would say, to present evidence to, to show that they have a likelihood of success on the merits. And that Mr. is precisely Mugabaro. right. That is precisely right. And assuming the first prong is met, which I understand there are questions about, um, the plaintiffs had the obligation to put forward evidence to show that their case had a, a, a likelihood of success on the merits. And this court, again, has said repeatedly, if they fail to do so, the case must be dismissed with prejudice and attorney's fees must be awarded. In this instance, plaintiffs did not put forward any evidence whatsoever. They quote a number of emails in both the unredacted and the redacted complaint. But I would proffer first, their quotes are not evidence. They are allegations of what the emails say, and they should have put the emails into the record. Either so I was in, correctly that they included at one point, and I'm blanking on the point, the deposition of um, 
what's his name, Mr. Stevens? John Stevens, they did quote from the deposition. They did put a part, part of that deposition into the record, but that was on the question of, of uh, whether or not Mr. Barton was allowed to vote, which is clearly a time barred issue. However, and this is for the two points, excuse me, the, 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 the two types of claims that remained after Judge Rigsby ruled on the 12B6 motion fall into two camps. One, the financial aspect, whether or not the, 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 the direct national council and the individual defendants breached their fiduciary duty by spending money to defend the resolution. The second one is the, the editor of the encyclopedia contract. None of the, there are no- I would add a third, although maybe you would say that all, this is all included in the um, 12B6 claims that, that were granted by the, by the judge. I, I would say that there's, um, that, that some of their claims relate to actions that were taken to prevent the opponents of the resolution from exercising their rights uh, to advocate against its adoption or to prevent members of the, relatedly to prevent members of the association from being adequately informed about the resolution. Now, are, are, you, say, are you saying that, that those, only the claims that were dismissed on 12B5, 12B6 grounds were in that category? I quite think so, but you may be right. Uh, the, those, yes, the, the, the claims that were dismissed under 12B6 fall into that category. What happened in 2013 uh, uh, during the process by which the resolution was adopted. Um, and those claims, again, I, I think Judge Rigsby properly dismissed those as time barred, which means they had no likelihood of success uh, under anti slap So what we have then are two types of claims then that are specifically anti slap one is you, wait, you uh, wasted and misappropriated money of the uh, uh, association. And the other is you punished opponents by, or at least one opponent, I guess, by removing him, one opponent, uh, or, <laughs> uh, um, by removing him from the um, editorship of the encyclopedia. Right, and that's- Or not, or not, a, or not continuing, however one Or not renewing, it. precisely. Um, and there are no, quoted emails relating to the finances. And in fact, I would proffer, and we, we, we go into this in our brief very in, in detail, the allegations in the complaint regarding the financial aspects of their claims are self-contradictory and in some cases not supported by public documents such as the Form 990s. So the plaintiffs Let's say we agree with you, Let's say we agree with you that the defendants um, simply fail to present evidence as they're supposed to, to show a likelihood of success um, right. on the merits. Is the proper, let's assume that's the only issue before us for the sake of simplicity here. If we found that, what would we do? Remand and say, we're reversing the judge's um, uh, uh, denial because the plaintiffs did not, because the plaintiffs did not carry their burden. Would that leave them open on remand to, um, uh, uh, fill the gap and uh, submit uh, evidence supporting their claims and show um, them the of success because because the judge did dismiss the did deny he did not grant the um, uh, uh, the motion or are you saying we would have to order the judge to grant the anti-slap motion? I, 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 we, we we would argue that the the we would have to be remanded for dismissal of the case on the on the, the grounds the plaintiffs did not meet their burden. Once Judge Rigsby found that the first the first prong was met, he should have required them to present evidence. They failed to do so. At that point, as this court has stated, the case must be dismissed with prejudice and attorney's fees must be awarded as a presumptive right to attorney's fees. So, so Judge Rigsby, under that scenario, your understanding is Judge Rigsby could not say, Oh, all right, we all made a mistake. We thought the complaint and the, and the various representations were sufficient. I'm gonna give the um, plaintiffs a chance to show with evidence that they could, on a claim by claim basis and so forth, defendant by defendant, claim by claim, that they are right. likely of success on the march. You think we could, Judge Rigsby does not have discretion to do that on remand? In um, that I, 
I, I think in this in, in this instance, I mean, there have been two uh, opinions by this court since Judge Rigsby uh, held the hearing and made a decision. But competitive enterprises v. Man was 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 issued before the hearing, and uh, and before his ruling. And I think competitive enterprises states that the what the standard is and what the requirements are. So everybody Ask was on notice. Man for a second, because you said you're talking about presentation of evidence. And yes. I'm wondering exactly what you envision by that, because man talks about the production or proffer of evidence. I think um, it doesn't talk about presentation of evidence, which would suggest to me, you know, full blown hearing with exhibits versus a proffer, which could be more informal by counsel. The I I, I think. In this particular case, given given the, the the again looking at the first part the first part the financial aspect of it, I think they would have to at least proffer and, and file with the court some documents that to show that they their view of the financial transactions is in fact at least enough to get to a jury. Did you did you make the argument? Did. The trial court? Complete would not be enough. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Judge Deal. I'm sorry. Judge Deal. Go ahead and go ahead, Judge Deal. But, but my mind is really a yes or no question. Did you make this argument to the trial court? We did make the argument in the reply brief that they had not failed, they had failed to prevent, present evidence. Yes. When you say reply brief, you mean in uh, the reply in support of your anti slap motion? Uh, yes. Yes, Your Honor. We did, say, and, and of course, we didn't raise it in the initial initial motion because they hadn't responded yet. So it was only in the reply brief that we could say, "Well, they haven't done it." Um, on the uh, on the other part of it, and, and I've I've gone way over. I apologize. Okay. On the other part of the editor, <laughs> the editor's contract, um, they have two problems. First, the contract by its explicit language states that they don't have to renew. So they can, you can't form a, a cause of action for not doing what the contract allows you not to do. Um, but more importantly, again, you the part of their claim but is- That can't be quite right because you could have tortious interference with a prospective business advantage. Um, but I mean, all of the, all of the uh, defendants purportedly, according to the complaint, all the defendants acted in their capacity as members of the National Council. We won't get into the fact that by the time these oh, things oh, happened, oh, half, the, okay, half right. the defendants weren't members. Um, but so you, the corporation can't conspire with itself. That's, that's, a, that's a basic. Um, but still, the, their argument, to, it's a lesser part of the complaint of, of that particular account, but part of their theory is that the editorship was a vital, vi uh, valuable, and vibrant uh, element of ASA's operations. Again, that's not supported in the record. There's no evidence of that. that is, there isn't even a quoted email in the complaint about that. It is simply, he didn't think he should have been, his contract should have been terminated because he thought he was doing a good job. Well, yeah, one reaction, and I guess I'm interested in your view on this. One reaction I have is that if there should have been a sifting of evidence on a claim by claim basis in the trial court, and if the judge didn't do it, this court should not ordinarily, at least, um, undertake that task in the first instance on appeal, but should rather send, be sending it back to the trial court to do that. Do you have a reaction to that view? Um, I, I, your Honor, I think it would be one thing if the plaintiffs had put into evidence, put, had, had filed oh, no, exhibits. Did they put in uh, sufficient yeah. evidence? But and, and Judge Rigsby simply said, you know what, I don't need to deal with it. I don't need to look at the exhibits. They didn't. They didn't even put the exhibits into the court record for Judge Rigsby to look at. So in this case, it's not like they actually gave him something that he ignored. It's that they didn't meet, they, they affirmatively yeah, I want didn't. To draw, I want to draw a distinction. I take your point that, that this court can say to the uh, plaintiffs, you didn't even try <laughs> right. Fact, right. to do what you had right. to do on, this, on the second prong. So we, we cannot, um, we must reverse uh, uh, on that basis. Um, 
it's another thing to say, well, we've heard Mr. Mugavaro point out the various reasons why various claims can't survive, and we'll go through this claim by claim ourselves and, and um, agree or disagree. That's a, diff that's a different sort of inquiry for us to, to undertake. It, it, I, I, I see the distinction, Your Honor, although um, given the burden of the plaintiffs under the empty slap, I think having failed to meet that burden, I think the court could look, well, let me put it this way. Why would we? If we felt well, they failed to present any evidence, why would we go further? I, well, Your Honor, I, I think that the, the, the fact of the matter is claims can fail for law reasons or legal reasons or for factual reasons. In this case, they failed for both. Um, and, and I think, yes, having, having failed to put any evidence into the record, I think the plaintiffs are, are, are pretty much done. But I think this court, as a matter of law, could look to the complaint and also say, for example, tortious interference doesn't, won't succeed because you can't, you can't tort, conspire with yourself. That's one example. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut up now and, and, and yield to Ms. LaHood before I get in any more trouble with her. Thank you, Your Honors. You're welcome. Ms. LaHood? Thank you, Your Honors. Maria LaHood for Dependent Salida. Um, I would like to address some of your initial questions about the first prong of the Anti-SLAPP Act. I don't think that it's plaintiff's claims that you look to because the Anti-SLAPP Act says it's the alleged act from which those claims arise. And I think the broadest, uh, the best case to look to for, for that, uh, for the phrase arising from is actually one we cited in our brief. It's Algernon Blair. It was from this court um, from 1989 saying it's well settled that statutory language employing the phrase arising from accepts a broad, general, and comprehensive coverage. Direct causation is not required. It's enough that the claim would not have arisen but for the presence of the asserted predicate. But that's so, not an anti-SLAPP case. No, there is not an anti-SLAPP case uh, interpreting arising from. In right, and I just, I guess I just had, when you start off by saying this doesn't have anything to do with the claim, the, I have trouble with that because the statutory language of 1655.02 says the movement must make, that means that the person seeking to um, get a special motion or f filing the special motion to dismiss, right, has to make a prima facie showing that the claim at issue arises from an act in furtherance of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest. And it seems to me we know what claims are, right? Claims are the things that you put in your complaint. And you say, well, I have these, this many claims, right? And then the act that arises um, arises from, and then we have act in furtherance of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest, and that is defined by statute, right? So, but, Well, the ahead. first answer is that the statute actually defines claims. And in that definition, it includes complaint. It includes causes of action. It includes other kinds of claims. So I think you can have a case like this from which the entire complaint arises from one act. But I can also, I can talk about the various acts. If you wanna look behind the, the boycott resolution, I can also talk about those acts. But first, let me just talk about this court's decision, recent decision in Saudi American Public Relations Affairs Committee, in which the, courts, the court mentioned the three claims at issue once and then it never mentioned them again. It went straight to the nucleus of facts and it didn't even analyze those statements um, individually. It lumped them together and talked about how they were made in the context of the larger policy. Um, well, if, if I remember right, this issue about whether or not the claims arose from uh, an act in furtherance of advocacy was not teed up for the court. So it doesn't surprise me that we didn't dig into this. Uh, is that right, that there was no, this issue was not raised in any way, or the court wasn't concerned with it? The, the plaintiffs did not challenge that this was, the academic boycott was a matter of public interest. But they, there, was, there was briefing on whether the act applied. I, I'm sorry, I, I meant in Saudi America. Oh, sorry. That's um, okay. The, 
whether they that they didn't allege that the it was there, there, there was no was argument wrong. about whether or not the claims arose from uh, an act of public public advocacy whether or not the anti slap act applied under that term so as so, I mean well, I was, guess I'm just it saying was I don't certainly about whether it was a public interest it was whether it was connected to the public interest and sure. if you look at the definition in the in the act you know, an act in furtherance of the right of advocacy means one of four things or three things. Each one of those talks about in connection with an issue of public interest. So both of these, so if you look broadly at what's in- but You have to have speech in okay. a certain form, right? And so, so I mean, in, right. in the Saudi Arabia case, which I find fondly call Staprak, um, it was a blog post, right? And it was so a defamatory me... blog post. And then there were other other claims in relation to the blog post, but it was speech to the world in an unquestionably public forum, right? On the internet to the world, right? Whereas here we are talking about actions taken within an organization that are alleged to have violated bylaws and rules of corporate governance. And, you know, you can say this is all about the resolution, but the fact of the matter is that if, you know, assume that these, these things happened, these bylaws were breached, um, or assume that they didn't happen, right, then these people don't have those claims, right? They're, they're, maybe they're, the speech is the downstream event, but their objection that they are coming to court to seek redress for is the fact that the organization has been co-opted in this way. And they wouldn't be able to come to court and make those objections if in fact, you know, everyone had disclosed on their platform for election that they really wanted to support this election, the, this resolution, right? And if they hadn't closed the voter rolls on the day or the membership rolls on the day of the election, right? It's, it's all about the process. It's not about the speech that comes after. I, I think, so let me address what are the underlying factual allegations underlying the claims. So I represent Dr. Salida. So just before you, before you do that, can you set the table for me a little? Is your response that this is a factual inquiry? That what My arises from, a claim that arises from an act of speech is, is an intensely factual inquiry. Is that the premise that you're starting from? No, I think you look to the alleg if if you don't accept that the boycott resolution, which is the reason this case is brought, satisfies the act that you need, then you look to the the actual. I think everyone agrees. We, I think everyone agrees. All parties agree that the resolution satisfies the act requirement. Oh. That's not the issue. The issue right. is whether the issue is whether the claims here arise from. Okay. That. So can I ask you a question or two? Can I? But I would like to answer the question about arising from about whether they arise from. But yes. Oh, okay. I wanted to do it before we get into the facts here. But go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, uh, that's. I don't want to. Go ahead. I can wait. Okay. So if you look at the. Plaintiff's only specific factual allegation against Dr. Salida is his advocacy for the 2013 boycott resolution as evidenced by a 2014 op-ed that he wrote. So that is obviously, uh, and that op-ed said he worked closely with, you know, or worked with U.S. ACB closely during the process of the, to pass the ASA resolution. That is advocacy he did was communicating views to members of the public on an issue of public interest. So count 12, which is for his advocacy, arises from his statements to the public. And, you know, they don't even, he wasn't on the National Council at this point. He was what they allege, uh, you know, part of U.S. ACBE, who was advocating for the boycott and advocated the ASA to pass the boycott. So that is is square within the anti-slap law, even if you go behind the boycott resolution. The second, the other two allegations that, that were talked about that are against Dr. Salida is that he was on the National Council when the decision was made to, you know, to expend money on the, the lawsuit, on defending the litigation that was brought by plaintiffs. 
funding litigation is considered um, expressive conduct involving petitioning in the government, or it could be statements made in connection with an issue under consideration by a judicial body. That's what it is. There's a case, we cite several cases that talk about that. So the funding to defend litigation, which is what they're actually claiming was done, falls under the anti-slap statute, that specific language. Um, one of the things they mentioned, and this was, this was- um, I wonder about that. Just because something is expressive and covered perhaps by the first amendment does not necessarily mean it falls within the definition. Well, of, um, of I don't think it's just because of that. I don't think it's only because it um, accords with the first amendment. I think it's because it actually falls within the language of petitioning the government or statements made in connection with an issue under consideration. You're, you're paying your lawyers to make those, uh, those communications with the judicial body. Mm -hmm. that, is, that, ha that has to be covered. See, it you seems know, to me you, you may be right when you point to things like the, the, the claims you brought, you just mentioned that there are some claims that do survive the requirement of prong one. But well, it seems to me that that doesn't necessarily address whether all the claims here. All do. the claims against Dr. Salida. Against fall Dr. Salida. Well, so let, let me just right. go with we the other claim. Your role. We understood your role in the advocacy here this and, morning and, to be but, more broadly covered. But, I, but these are the main claims against all defendants. So I'm- well, Let I'm, me ask you about that. Here's a hypothetical. Suppose a claimant, a member of the um, association came along and said, you know, I love this resolution. I think this resolution is the best resolution that, this, that has ever been issued by this body. However, I'm really offended by the process by which this was conducted because, because the rights of me and other members of the body were, were in various ways interfered with. And I'm really offended by what they did to uh, Professor Bronner and so on and so forth. So I'm filing these claims. I think there were breaches of fiduciary duty here. It's a matter of principle for me. I don't, I, the fact that I happen to agree with the resolution doesn't mean I agree with the process by which they um, did it. Now, suppose you had that person before you and the judge credited, or a jury could credit that you could say <laughs> that testimony. Um, would, would, would you still be saying that the anti-slap motion applies? I think- well, He would say it doesn't arise out of the resolution. I don't care about the resolution. I care about what these people were doing. My I claims arise before the resolution was even issued. I think it's important to look to the purpose of the statute as the DC Council said, and as Mann affirmed, the purpose is to assure that defendants can fend off lawsuits filed by one side of a political or public policy debate aimed to punish or prevent the expression of opposing points of view. So you look behind it and you say, this case is brought because the people disagree with the boycott resolution and all the claims flow from that. If I can just talk about the one can last I, claim. Can I just, can well, I, can I, can I flip it then? What what if I hate the resolution? And I'm so mad at your client that I sue your client for something totally different, right? I decide I'm gonna sue him for breach of contract because he sold me a car. What was that car judge deal that you were trying to sell in the earlier case? It was a, Bu it was a Buick Skylark. It was a Buick Skylark. He sold me a Buick Skylark and it was a lemon. And I, you know, we were friends and I was willing to kind of put up with it and just tinker with it on weekends. But then he went off and, you know, passed this resolution and I'm mad and I'm going to take him to court and sue him for breach of contract for selling me a dud car. Any slap I, motion? Because it's arising out of might, his... I think you might have a malicious prosecution claim, but if there's no actual it's act... A, it's, the, it's a real, it really is a dud car. So it's, I'm sorry, I, have a can, valid, can, I have a valid breach of contract claim or, or a, an arguable one. It's not, it's not malicious. I mean, I, it's malicious because it's motivated, I guess, because of this speech, the so, genesis, to borrow Mr. Mugavero's uh, language, is, is the resolution. But there's, there's a real arguable breach of contract claim on, based on whether or not he disclosed the the uh, faults with the, the car. So the defendant would have a right if they wanted to bring an anti-slap motion and 
the there would have to be evidence submitted so they could say i mean they would have to point to the act they could use evidence maybe to say here's this backstory here's why i know i'm being targeted but there has to be something that's a statement or expressive conduct in the anti slap statute and then there would be evidence put forth proffered or produced to decide whether those claims were likely to proceed again this is just the first prong. There's also a clump. Was hey, baby, your, your, you answer is, your answer is motive is enough. It can be a claim that is entirely separate I from don't, any speech act, so long as the motive behind the lawsuit is a speech act. Is that right? I, I'm not saying that, Your Honor. Okay. I'm then, saying, because I think there are acts here. There, are every single again, and I can get to the final act. Every single. I, I, I appreciate that. I just. It has we're, to we're satisfy the statute. My hypothetical. So why why is why is Judge Deal's um, question about motive or or inquiry? He was confirming you're saying motive is enough if you can connect I, it to speech downstream, which was my I hypothetical, and now you're saying no. So we're just. I don't think I don't out. think motive is enough in, in both okay. in in man and in Saprik and in close it and in Friedman. Everyone looked to context, right? So you can't. You can't necessarily just look at the statements to know. You have to look at the bigger policy debate and what's actually going on. But those those Our cases sales. don't help you so much because in those cases, right, the, the claims were related, I mean, directly premised on the speech, right? I mean, it, it seems to me you're, that it's being suggested that only defamation claims can be can be brought can be challenged by the anti slap statute, and that's just not the case. No, I, I, my hypothetical was I have a claim that is not premised on the speech, but is motivated by the speech, and I'm I, asking I, whether the anti slap this whether you can file a special motion to dismiss uh, to get that case kicked out of court in a case where it shouldn't be kicked out of court on 12b6 grounds or summary judgment grounds. This is a case that should go to a jury. But, but the motive is there, and I'm trying to figure out whether you think the Anti-SLAPP Act applies. I think you have to apply the statute as it says, and you need to be able to point to statements or expressive conduct that fall within the act. So I don't know about the car salesman or, you know, whether that, I, I, think, I think context matters. I don't think intent is enough if the case does not actually, if the claims don't arise from an act in furtherance of advocacy on a matter of public interest. So if I could just go to the last the last claim, which is that Dr. Slyada again was on the National Council when Dr. Bronner's contract wasn't renewed. And we've always also already gone through the fact that he had no entitlement to renewal under the contract, um, which I can say more about. But basically Bronner's allegations are that defendants didn't renew his contract solely because of their difference of opinion on the boycott resolution. They say that at four different points in the complaint, um, which I'm happy to, to say. So the factual allegations that Bronner purports support his claims are that defendants spread false statements that he conspired to undermine the ASA because he opposed the, re opposed the resolution. His own factual allegations supporting his claim uh, of non-renewal of the contract, which were for breach of fiduciary duty and tortious interference are essentially a defamation claim. They're that the, that the defendants, not Dr. Salida, but the defendants indiscriminately spread false information about him to the public. Those are clearly claims under, under the Anti-SLAPP Act. The, and, I, and again, I think here you look to the, you know, the in connection with an issue of public interest. Saprik, you know, even though there were statements that focused on the plaintiff as an individual, the court found they were made in the context of a firestorm between two competing Middle East special interest groups. This was a firestorm around the boycott resolution. Um, you know, the it's not just that Bonner only sued people who are involved in U.S. Act B and no one else. It's that he, you know, looked to the looked to the context. He also pulled his entire department. Um, that he chaired from the ASA. He brought this litigation against the ASA about the boycott resolution. So if you look to the, you don't even have to look to the broader context here, because if you look at what he alleges, he alleges that they spread false information about him in connection with an issue of public interest, the boycott resolution. Um, the, 
you mentioned the bylaws. There are two are, different are you bylaws. Not bothered by the sweep of your interpretation of the anti slap act statute? I am or not, Your Honor, given the purpose, given the purpose of the anti slap act, which is to fend off this litigation, plaintiffs can provide evidence to show that their claims have merit. If they do that, the anti slap act doesn't apply and they proceed. But if they are targeting speech with meritless claims that they can't provide evidence to support, then the DC Council has found in the balance of the interests that the case should be dismissed under the anti slap act. When you say targeting speech, you see, that's really getting, I think, to the issue that I find myself grappling with, which again is the scope of arises from. A claim for breach of fiduciary duty in the, in the conduct of an election, for example, or in the use of entrusted funds does not in its content or proof have anything to do with an attack on speech. It's a claim that focuses on non-speech activities that are not protected um, or not intended to be protected by the Anti-SLAPP Act. What's bothersome is when that sort of a claim is marshaled, even if it's meritorious. But, if it, but at your point is if it's meritorious, then it survives. Um, that puts a lot of faith in the procedures of the Anti-SLAPP Act. Um, but um, the, the, what's troublesome is when uh, somebody looks at that claim and says, well, we can tell that the real reason they're bringing that claim, their real motive is because of their apathy or antipathy toward our, their antipathy toward our particular um, act in furtherance of public advocacy. And um, that strikes me as a very hard standard to apply. How does the judge, now here you could say, well, we could look at their complaint. They made the mistake of throwing in a lot of stuff in the complaint about the resolution. Well, maybe, but um, th that is a, th this notion, it, it really does sort of focus on, motion, on, on motive because the substance of the resolution the merits of the resolution don't really have anything to do with proving the various claims, relief that would be obtained um, uh, in this lawsuit, most of them. Uh, I think you may have a point about some of them. Uh, so I don't want to get bogged down in the claim by claim detail. You see the problem and I wonder if you'd comment on it. Well, there are two things, Your Honor. One, I think you know, if you say that some certain kinds of claims are exempt, like fiduciary duty breach, you can, you know, a, a plaintiff could fashion their their claim in a way to avoid the anti slap Act application. It is not about the claims. It's about the factual, assuming that it's, it's about the factual allegations undergirding the claims. And in this case, I've gone through all the factual allegations that undergird the, the, the claims against Dr. Salida. And they against all- Against Dr. All Salida, I understand. And, and most I, of the, I'm, and most I'm looking of the, at this now from the defendant. perspective of a judge who has to decide. So, right. I, again, I don't, <laughs> I, don't think it's, I don't think it's motive. And I'm sorry if I suggested it was earlier. I think you can look at the actual acts that are alleged and the, you know, the statements or the expression or the expressive conduct um, but, and see can if I that's just. Like, can I jump in and say, you know, you said you can't carve out certain claims and I don't, I don't hear anyone on the panel suggesting that you would carve out, for example, breach of fiduciary duty, right? I, I could see a case where you have, um, you know, an officer of the organization make a, you know, write an op-ed that someone then says, look, that op-ed, the content of that statement somehow breached your fiduciary duty, you, you disclosed confidences or you, you know, um, somehow breached your fiduciary duty to the organization when you made that public statement, right? So I don't think anyone's talking about carving out certain types of claims, but what we are saying is, what are the claims, you know, it, it seems like you have to start with the act in furtherance 
of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest and you build out from that. The claim is based on that. And here it seems like the claim is based on these breaches of fiduciary duty and bylaws and all of that stuff. A breach of fiduciary duty, Your Honor, is the claim. The factual allegations are exactly as your hypothetical. They're exactly the same. They are that, that defendants, all of them, may spread false information about, about plaintiff Bronner to the public. If you look on the, at the allegations, there's no, no one has mentioned any other allegation underlying the fiduciary duty breach or the tortious interference breach besides the spread of false information. So it's, you know, in, it is that example. It is precisely that example. You can't just say the name of the claim and say it doesn't apply. You have to look at what are the facts supporting that claim. And if you look on pages, pardon? I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I shouldn't have interrupted no, you. Just right well, I, I, let, me, let me, before you sit down, I'll ask you just one hypothetical further to crystallize the scope of, of, of your claim. And I respect that this is a difficult issue where there's arguments on both sides. Um, so suppose money is entrusted to the um, of officers of the association and the money is entrusted saying this money is to be used for the encyclopedia and um, you know the parties we have at which all the members get together and for a few other purposes. And the officers say, you know, we have a really good use for this money that it really was not intended for, but we have a really good use for it. It's to publish this resolution and get us involved in that larger um, dispute that's, that's very much in the public um, domain and public interest. And so they, in effect, use that money for a purpose for which it was not entrusted. And the resolution is issued. And the people who uh, had an interest in that money, the members of the organization, who say, well, you're not using that money for the purpose it was meant to be used for. And we're, we as members are, are injured that way. Leave aside whether it's a derivative claim or a um, direct claim. That's not really the issue here. The, 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 um, we, I take it your position is that a suit for misappropriation of those funds for reaching into that bank account and taking, taking it out when you had no authority to do it would be at the very least subject to a motion to dismiss under the Anti-SLAPP Act and the first prong would be satisfied. It, do, it I, might, do I understand it your might. position correctly or not? Now, your answer could be, it, well, yes, and but there's a safeguard because the plaintiffs can show that the second prong um, is not met. They have a good chance of success on, or a good likelihood of success on the merits. Um, I, I just want to know how you react to that hypothetical. I think it depends, Your Honor, for the first prong, what those funds were used for. The, as the not resolution, enough, as in this well, case. but 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 again, I'm not. I'm, I'm no longer arguing that you can't look behind that. Correct? If it's used for litigation, if it's used for publishing the statement, if it's used for, you know, those kinds of things would fall under the act. If it's for having a party or whatever that is not going to be considered expressive conduct. No, my point is it's used for the litigation and publishing the statement. It's used for those First Amendment. Well, um, those. Then, it's, used for then, it's used for things that constitute an act. Yes, if, if, it the, if it's used for things that constitute an act, then you go to the second prong and you say, but they violated these bylaws or they misused, you know, misused the funds in whatever way, which again, when the Anti-Slap Act applies, plaintiffs then get to show that their claims are meritorious or at least not unlikely not to succeed and they can proceed. Now, let me, but I guess what bothers me about that conclusion is that it really does go, I think, well, no, maybe you would say it would. It doesn't. So, in other words, even if the um, plaintiffs credibly say, "Look, we love the resolution. It's just that we don't like you spending our money, you know, for that purpose," um, uh, and that's why we're suing. You would say it doesn't matter what that that it's not motivated by antipathy to the resolution. It's right. it's just the objective facts. That's your that's your position. Yeah. So, okay. 
Okay. Um, so, Mr. Hood, I take so, it. Uh, you know, know I can go to the minutes, claims if you want. Minutes, if, sorry, I know I'm over time. I could go to additional reasons that the claims are not likely to succeed, but it seems like that's not where the focus is. So, I can also, I can also end. Uh, well, I think we did hear from Mr. Mugavero on that, and we're about to hear from Mr. Kleinman, I think, right? I mean, there are some additional reasons for Dr. Salida. If I just All right, take, take a minute quickly, I, guess. I know you have a um, specific client and you're concerned to have his interest. Um, you know, he's the, for the, for the tortious interference claim, um, Defendant Salida was on the National Council at the time, which plaintiffs concede at paragraph 332 of their complaint that that they wouldn't have a tortious interference uh, claim against him. Um, the, so the other one is just- Well, maybe I should ask you this question then that I, is similar to what I asked Mr. Mugavero. Um, putting aside the first prong issue, um, if we were just dealing with the second prong issue, don't we have to remand for the trial judge to deal with the claims uh, and the evidence supporting them that, that can be adduced to support them. Uh, issue by issue, claim by claim, defendant by defendant? Um, I think- uh, Which wasn't done. The, the, or at least not explicitly done. Well, again, I think the anti under the Anti-Slap Act, you know, the, the claims can fail on the law and they can fail on the facts. I think here, they, they also fail on, I mean, it is true that plaintiffs did not submit evidence to support them, I believe they all fail on the law as well. So I think that analysis could be done by this court. I if see. the court's so inclined to, to remand, to, to consider, to give plaintiffs another chance to consider evidence and to proffer evidence, then yes, that's something that would need to be done by the, by the trial court. I'm, I'm sorry, just to ask one last question on that point uh, about claims failing under the law, you know, on essentially on 12b6 grounds. Do you think that likelihood of success under any slap is synonymous with um, 12B grounds for dismissal? No, but I think if a, if a, if a claim- or the, I asked my claim, question, I asked my question badly, not synonymous with, but likelihood of success would incorporate both sort of your ability to substantiate with facts and any um, legal defenses against those claims. Yes, I think that if a if a claim fails to state a claim under 12b6, then it is not and cannot be likely to succeed on the merits. And and why would I mean, first of all, in in Mann, we said the anti-slap statute is not supposed to be redundant of 12b6. So is that consistent with our statement in Mann? Yes, because the anti-slap act provides additional protections, right? You can bring it early. You can you can get resolution um, uh, resolution to the to the claims quickly by the court. The court is mandated to hear it quickly. You can get uh, you can get attorneys' fees with the statute. You can also it's there's interlocutory appeal. So there are various ways that the anti slap Act offers protections that are not covered by by 12b6. Right, but we didn't make the statement about redundancy in those con in the context of talking about attorney's fees or earlier relief, right? We were we were talking about the need to present evidence to to um, respond to the prima facie case, which just suggests to me that we were envisioning the anti-slap uh, statute as providing sort of a, a different quality of protection separate and apart from the procedural protections that are available under 12b6. Right, that's, you know, the evidence part is what makes it more like Rule 56, but it's obviously not a substitute for, you know, for Rule 56 either. I think it's a, it's a blend so that you can use 12, you know, you can say that this, that the allegations fail in the law, but if plaintiffs provide evidence, then you need to contend on the level of, of the evidence. So you need to do what's essentially a Rule 56 review. So right, I think but you it's see, not- You see where I'm going? I mean, this is an open question, I think, still in our jurisdiction, how to interpret the statute and whether we say, hey, these sort of procedural defenses that you could raise under a 12b6 motion that have nothing to do with the, the quality of the claim um, can be raised under a special motion to dismiss and can generate attorney's fees. We've not said that yet, right? But you no, think we should- in, Well, in Mann, 
you said that it, it includes, you know, claims and defenses, right? When you look to, um, I guess, and that was in the context of whether uh, a case- But those were substantive defenses to, to defamation, right? I mean, it's whether or not someone's a public figure or whether, right? Am I well, wrong about yes. that? I, but I think it said, you know, as opposed to procedural. I think here we're talking about the substance of the claims. We're just not necessarily talking, we're just saying that you can decide them on the law or you can decide them on the facts. Clearly, at this stage, we went on the facts because plaintiffs didn't supply any evidence whatsoever. So we could stop there. But we're saying they also fail on the law. That means that they're not likely to succeed on the merits. There could be procedural, you know, procedural arguments that, that wouldn't satisfy that. So, so in that way, 12b-6 is different from, from anti-SLAPP as well. Um, but if it's a substantive reason to dismiss the claim, then it's not likely to succeed on the merits. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kleiman, it's your turn. Thank you, Your Honor. Mark Kleiman here on behalf of Professor um, Kate Halani and Professor Puar. Um, under either um, anti-SLAPP standards or traditional 12b-6 standards, um, the claims against all of the defendants should be thrown out, be, uh, all of the individual defendants, because of the immunities afforded under the Federal Volunteer uh, Protection Act. Um, there is no question that the act applies uh, um, in, in D.C. Um, the D.C. Corporations Code actually specifies that it, the, the code will not limit, um, you know, any rights or immunities of directors or volunteers may have under, um, the, under a federal statute. Uh, in the and judge, judge, Contr judge Contreras rejected this argument, right, in the DDC? Um, judge Contreras rejected that, that argument. That's correct, Your Honor. However, Judge Contreras also ruled um, that none of the plaintiff's derivative claims claimed that actions by the defendants somehow harmed either the ASA or the individual members of the ASA um, survived that these plaintiffs could not advance um, um, under Article Three claims that um, were, were not their own. Um, yet Judge Rigsby below in the Superior Court used precisely the, the argument of derivative claims, which the plaintiffs are collaterally stopped from litigating um, to hold that the anti-slap statute um, doesn't apply. Excuse me. I mean, it, it, it sounds like you're making a good for the goose, good for the gander type of argument. You know, if you messed up one way, then you should mess up our way too. Uh, I, I guess my question is, what is your view or response to Mr. Marcus's argument that we shouldn't revisit the immunity question, seeing as how it was decided by the DDC? I think there was an opportunity to appeal it, given that you guys did take an appeal uh, to the DC circuit in that case. Uh, and, and it never raised that issue. Um, the, the immunity question as ruled, by, as ruled on by Judge Contreras, as we understand it, was um, uh, essentially mooted um, because, you know, because of Judge Contreras's findings that there were no derivative claims possible. So the underlying factual premise um, is is different in the superior court than it was um, in, in the district court. Had Judge Contreras gone on to rule on the mer the merits of the um, derivative claims um, and to say that those claims were not um, um, pr protected under the um, VPA, then we would have. I agree. Then we would have a different situation. But that's not what we're confronted with. So, um, it, it, it's our it's our position that once the um, superior court motion to dismiss 
was ruled on, um, it we should have gotten once the um, once the claims alleging um, derivative harm to either the ASA or its members were um, precluded. Um, there is no way under the law that Judge Rigsby could then um, return to those claims which cannot be advanced and say that these are somehow beyond the purview um, of the Volunteer Protection Act. Um, the other piece of this statute, which I, I think is very, very central to this, is that the VPA requires a showing that there was an intent to harm individuals. Um, and that, you know, without a showing that there was an intent to harm individuals, there's no way to get out from under the immunities afforded by the statute, which um, is according to its own terms in, intended to be um, interpreted broadly to, to afford protection and to encourage people to participate in voluntary and nonprofit organizations. Mr. Uh, Palmin, one thing I wonder is whether given that Judge um, Rigsby did not address this argument, whether we should be addressing it in the first instance, or whether it should be addressed on remand. Uh, if it were to be, if it were to be addressed on remand, um, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not certain, Your Honor, that it would be fruitful to have it addressed on remand for the simple reason that the plaintiffs are collaterally stopped from asserting derivative claims. So, um, well, right, I, I understand. So I'm I, not I sure. Mean, yeah, you may have a 12b. You may have a 12b6 motion here rather than simply a summary judgment motion um, on this ground. What? This was this was part of our this was part of our twelve b six motion, Your Honor. Um, so but the twelve b six motion itself is not. I mean, if you think of it in isolation, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. it's not appealable at this time. That's this, right. be, this being an interlocutory appeal, limited to the um, uh, denial of the anti slap motion to dismiss. Oh, I, I would go back to what my colleague, Ms. LaHood, pointed out, which is that if something, if a cause of action is barred by 12b-6, it's challenging to understand how um, the plaintiffs could possibly demonstrate a likelihood of success, which is the anti-slap standard. Um, given the fact that they're barred from pre, um, pre, from proceeding with the claim in the first place. How far do you think that proposition can be pushed? Suppose there were a 12B6 motion in which that is purely procedural in nature. Um, the, the motion say says um, service of process uh, was... Uh, was inadequate, the, case, the claim should be dismissed, or personal jurisdiction. Um, is it your view that regardless of the ground for granting the 12B6 motion, the court must still consider whether um, the anti-slap motion to dismiss based on those claims should be granted as well because of the availability of attorney's fees, or perhaps you have some other reason why you would say that. Well, um, f first of all, the the answer, uh, my answer to that question, Your Honor, is yes. Um, so, regardless of the ground on which the twelve, suppose that suppose, I mean, sometimes, uh, well, all right, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I the literal words of the statute are likely uh, likelihood of success. Yes, um, but we've suggested that that's some sort of term of art. Right, and, and I guess I'm wondering why on earth would that serve the purpose of the statute? If I have a winning defamation claim, but I you know, fail to serve my complaint properly, um, but substantively it's a winning claim, why, why would any slap apply to that? Well, uh, this goes back to the question of what the motivation for bringing um, the winning defamation claim was. 
and whether I don't think it does. I think, for, that, yeah. I think you're skipping to a different issue. I think we're we're just talking about what likelihood of success means. And and my thinking was that likelihood of success was really related to the essence of the claim and whether it was um, you know a claim that was trying to silence speech, you know, legitimate speech. But if I have a winning defamation claim that just loses for some other reason, a procedural reason, um, I, you know, I don't understand why why the putative defendant should get attorney's fees for that. I wasn't trying to silence legitimate speech. I was trying to defend myself against defamatory speech in my hypothetical. Okay, well, I, perhaps I'm misunderstanding something, Your Honor, but I have a hard time dissecting um, the idea that this is a de defamation claim from why the claim is being brought in the first place. Because if the claim was not being brought in an effort to retaliate or silence, um, uh, you know, um, speech about a matter of public interest, um, we wouldn't be there. Um, the, the idea of an anti-slap statute is that plaintiffs don't get to drag people into court um, on claims of questionable merit because of their speech act. If a claim is obsolete because of the statute of limitations um, or other grounds, and somebody is dragged into court um, on a defamation action, are they in any way um, less inconvenienced, expensed, um, chilled in terms of future speech because um, the problem was procedural rather than factual? I don't think so. Um, the duty of the plaintiff is to bring a claim that A, has some uh, likely basis of support, and B, is procedurally sound. I have um, a winning defamation claim, but I'm one day late under the statute of limitations. And it's just, it was a mis mistake, you know, that I miscalculated or my lawyer miscalculated and we thought we could file on the day that we filed and, you know, it was a screw up. But I have a winning defamation claim. You get attorney's fees for that? Because my claim gets kicked on a statute of limitations? Well, there are provisions. Unfound? I mean, it's, it's undoubtedly late, but it's undoubtedly a winning defamation claim. Um, undoubtedly late with um, reasons for tardiness due to mistake, inadvertence, or excusable neglect um, make, make this an arguable claim. So I would agree that at that point, under that limited hypothetical, I think your honor is correct. But that's not, that's quite a ways from what we have here. Well, um, but it's, it's my hypothetical, and I'm trying to figure out why this anti-slap statute would want to apply to that. I, I hear you saying, well, maybe even if it, you could file a special motion to dismiss or, or bring your statute of limitations defense under the guise of a special motion to dismiss and, and seek attorney's fees, and a judge could say, well, extraordinary circumstances, I'm not going to award attorney's fees. But I'm trying to figure out why the the authors of the statute, why the DC Council would have wanted to bring those sorts of um, defenses under the anti-slap statute, which really seemed to me very focused on free flow of, of legitimate speech with an element of kind of David versus Goliath. We're trying to protect the little guy from being crushed by big corporate defendants from keeping, you know, the little guy, the activists from speaking out on things. Um, and, the, and, you know, the idea that, you know, these various procedural defenses bring this under, under an anti-slap special motion to dismiss just doesn't seem to square with that. Well, I'd suggest, I'd suggest, Your Honor, that we need to have at that point a factual, um, inquiry. Let me, I would submit. I, counsel, counsel can, I, can I just ask maybe as, see if you agree with this. Mm -hmm. Nothing stops a trial court from saying that special circumstances make a fee award unjust in that circumstance, right? That's right. 
So the anti-slap statute could apply even to these sort of procedural bars, you know, if, if it's a meritorious claim otherwise with the day late, the trial court could say, well, it's dismissed, anti-slap slap statute applies, but I'm not going to award any attorney's fees because when I look at it, this thing was a dead winner. You just got it in a day late. Absolutely, Your Honor. I mean, the the other point is that um, that this is, um, Judge Easterly's hypothetical is not what our case is about by quite a long shot. Um, we have we have a case where it's not a procedural objection to um, you know the plaintiff's claim. Um, it's the fact that. Um, there was a judicial determination after ferocious advocacy on both sides that um, derivative claims couldn't be pursued as a matter of law. That's substantive. It's not a procedural matter. Um, so it's, it's, it, uh, it, it's an interesting inquiry and one that I can see why this court would um, be concerned with, but it's um, not a grounds to deny relief to the defendants in this case. Okay. Are you, uh, you, you've used up your two minutes. How did that happen? <laughs> I, think I, I, I think I have, Your Honor. I, I, um, I, I did have a, 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 a couple of um, other um, brief remarks that are specific to my clients, if the court has a moment. Um, we'll, give you, we'll give you a moment. I realize you're representing specific individuals that uh, uh, want to be here. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. This, um, the th as to the specifics of uh, Professor Bronner and the editorship because he is the one person who um, has an allegation uh, that uh, he was directly injured. There are two things that need to be noted ab about my clients. The first is that um, Professor Puar was never on the National, um, um, commit the National Council of the ASA her term on the nominating committee ended three years, more than three years actually, before this matter ever came up for review. Um, the idea that she had anything to do with any of this um, is really a, quite a stretch. Um, nor, and there's certainly no evidence to support it. And um, the other point being that Professor Kehalani's term ended before um, uh, Dr. Brunner's contract expired. Um, so it's, it's not clear um, what either of them could or should have allegedly done about this under any circumstances. And of course, since there's been no evidentiary showing, we never had an opportunity to um, discuss that uh, at the lower court. Okay. Um, we will give, uh, you'll have to think among yourselves how this would work, but we will give you some time for rebuttal. Let us hear now from, um, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, it, well, actually, the name I have here is not quite what I expected to see. Are we hearing from Mr. Marcus? Yes, sir. Okay. Can uh, you hear me? I can hear you. Let us hear you from you, Mr. Okay. Marcus. Thank you. Um, I think I there said, are a the reason I said what I said is my my um, list of participants lists uh, Jennifer Gross, who I take it is not arguing. Is that right? Uh, did you hear me? No, sir, I did not. Oh, I, I said my list of participants um, identifies Jennifer Gross as the attorney uh, uh, who's arguing. I take it she is not arguing. She is not, and I, I uh, the court graciously granted my uh, pro hoc application last week. Uh, yes, and that was I, so I, I, I could argue. Yes. Um, I, I think there are a couple of preliminary points, many of which are, are, uh, are I think, uh, embedded in some of the questions that the panel has been asking, particularly just recently, um, that allow us to make this path a little bit straighter and less confusing. The, the first point is that this is, as Judge Easterly's question suggested, this is a case about corporate governance. 
This is a nonprofit organization, and there was an effort essentially to launch a hostile takeover. And it really is no different. The claims here are no different than the claims that would be prosecuted in, in a normal corporate context where there was an effort to take control of an organization that has members, it has votes, it has a board of directors, it has solicitations for votes, it has the use of corporate assets, and all of the actions that are at issue here relate to those violations. They do not relate to speech. And the way you can tell that is that the DC legislature has given us, the DC council has given us help here. We're not, we're not just trying to decide what the right answer is on a blank slate. There's a statute and the statute says uh, in two different sections, it gives us a lot of useful information. The first thing it says is that a party may file a special motion to dismiss any claim arising from an act in furtherance of the right of advocacy. So what is a claim? And what is an act in, in furtherance of a right of advocacy? Well, happily, the statute defines those things. And it defines them as follows. It says a claim includes any civil lawsuit, claim, complaint, cause of action, cross-claim, counterclaim, or other civil judicial pleading or filing requesting relief. It's exactly what we all know as lawyers. It's a count. It's not a reason for a count. It's, it's a legal claim. In what the same what way about that Ms. LaHood's point that um, it says a lawsuit, which seems to be a broader umbrella term that might refer to a collection of claims and the um, foundational facts. I agree that it, it could include a collection of claims, but when you're talking about dismissing a lawsuit, we all know what that means. That means you're filing a motion to dismiss. And what it means is that, I mean, just think about the word in English. What is a claim? Well, it's a demand that you, you owe me something. I have a claim on you. It doesn't mean you committed an act. It means you committed an act that gives rise to a claim. So if you put your hand in the cookie jar and you took out money from, a, from a, uh, a, a, an account that you weren't supposed to use for ex anything other than specified purposes, that's a claim. But it is a claim because it's a claim that gives rise to a claim for relief. And I think that's the right way to understand it. We don't have to torture the English language to understand it. And it makes sense of the statute that way. It also avoids all of the other problems that the court, I think, was, was uh, confronting about, well, how much do we have to get into motive? How much do we have to get into why these people are here rather than those people? And here I want I mean, to take maybe, a little- Counsel, maybe, maybe we don't in this case because your complaint makes it quite clear that the impetus for it is their adoption of the 2013 resolution without which there would be no claim or loss. Well, it doesn't make, first of all, I don't think it does make that clear. And so and I'll do two important facts, one of which is inconsistent with what all my friends have been saying and the other of which is something that they've just ignored. And the two facts are, A, there are plenty of people on the board that we didn't sue who have lots of the same opinions. And the second is that there was one defendant, Avery Gordon, whom we dropped as a defendant. If you Google Avery Gordon, we'll find that she is a prominent advocate for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, movement against Israel. We dropped her as a defendant because when we got their emails, we found out that she hadn't participated in the acts at issue that give rise to the claims. So we dropped her. We didn't sue everybody that we disagree with. That's just, it's a canard. It's just not so. There are plenty of people we disagree with that we didn't sue. Mr. So, Marcus, I, I think the problem is that one, one term, the anti-slap act statute does not define is arising from or arise from. And the question before us, I think, comes down to, at least with, the at least with regard to the first problem, the question before us comes down to how broadly or narrowly we define that term. So I think the Judge, right way- Judge, Judge um, Rigsby, for example, um, can be said to have given it a fairly broad interpretation uh, when he said that if it had not been for the, he said boycott, but he meant the resolution. If it had not been for the resolution, we wouldn't be here. And um, that's not a frivolous argument by any stretch of the imagination because we have case law giving a broad interpretation to words like arising from. 
And we do have a concern by the council to protect um, the kinds of advocacy that the resolution represents. So uh, I'm interested in your take on how broadly or narrowly how we should define a rise from. I think it should be facts that give rise to a claim. And I don't think that incur that risks the problems because just as it's clear that here we didn't sue people who engage in speech just because they engage in the speech that we don't like. We only sued people who put their hand in the cookie jar or who disseminated false information in the same way that you would do it if there were a proxy contest in a corporate context. Well, I think one thing they're saying though is that you only sued the subset of people who put their hand in the cookie jar whose speech you didn't like. No. Like, there's a whole lot of other people who put their hand in the cookie jar that you didn't sue. Uh, if they're saying that, I'm not aware of it, and I'm not aware of anybody who put their hand in the cookie jar that we didn't sue. We, we've, we've alleged there are improper expenditures made, and everybody who we thought was responsible for those improper expenditures, we sued. And if they weren't responsible for it, we didn't sue them, and I think that's one of the reasons that we dropped Professor Gordon. So it, it's just not the case that there are people who, I mean, I don't think there's anybody who, you know, uh, engaged in Im improper financial expenditures, but wasn't a supporter of BDS. And so we said, okay, well, let's not sue them because they're our friends. That didn't can, I just, can I just read in response to Judge Lookman's question, the case that Ms. LaHood cites? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read from Algernon for a second, where it says, it is uh, well settled that the statutory language of pulling the phrase arising from is broad. Granted, it's a different statute, but uh, the next part is it has been held to suffice where a claim is said to arise from some predicate, that there be a substantial connection or nexus between them, that's enough. Um, so, you know, if, if there's a substantial connection between the speech, the 2013 resolution, and the claims that are being asserted, we might say that the claims arose under the reasoning in algebra. Now, I suspect you have some distinctions or, or why we shouldn't read the SLAP Act, anti slap Act so broadly, uh, but what, what's your response to that cases uh, rather broad interpretation of statutory phrase. My recollection is that in that case as well, the facts that were said to have a connection to the claim were the facts that gave the plaintiff the right to go to court. And I, I think that if you were to expand it beyond that and you start asking, well, why are these people really here? I mean, lawyers appear in front of courts every day for one reason, because they get paid. And we don't ever say, well, you're not saying that because you believe it. You're saying it because you're getting paid to believe it. We look at the merits of their argument. If the merits of their argument are valid, we adopt them. I mean, I think they've disavowed a let's look behind at the motive. I think they might even agree that we could stick to the face of the complaint. Um, and if that were true, that might solve your conundrum that, you know, if we stick to the face of the complaint, it sure looks like this is being motivated by the 2013 resolution. You don't think so? No, because no, for precisely the reason that I think animated some of the questions, which is if... If the, if the res, I mean, I guess one way of saying it is this, there are other academic societies that have adopted re these resolutions that didn't get sued. And they didn't get sued because they didn't breach their fiduciary duty on the way to doing it. And so the question is not, who am I paying attention to? The question is, what did I sue you for doing? And if there's a breach of fiduciary duty, we're entitled to enforce our client's rights for, for breach of fiduciary duty <clears throat> without asking, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Well, without asking, well, why, are, why, Mr. Lawyer, are your passions engaged in this case? That's not an appropriate question. The question is, what are the merits of the claim? What is the claim based on? <clears throat> and and it's the not other like the complaint in this case doesn't have a lot to say about the resolution. Well, it doesn't have a lot to say about the resolution, and I think that's a point in our favor. We're not debating the, the merits of the resolution. We're not asking the court, I mean, in, in previous rounds of briefing in this case, we've gotten hundreds of pages on the merits of the Arab-Israeli dispute. We're not here about that. <clears throat> We're not asking the court to decide anything about that. And I think it's also important to note that the only false information that we focused on has nothing to do with the merits of that dispute. In other words, we didn't say, oh, you promoted this resolution by saying false things about Israel or false things about the Arabs or false things about Palestine. That's not what happened here. The issue was just, did you, did, you, <laughs> did you actively conceal your program when you were trying to get control of the organization? That's a, that's a bread and butter corporate governance question. You've got people running for, I mean, there are people who are trying to take over or get seats on the board of a corporation all the time. 
and they issue proxy statements or they issue communications that says, this is what I want to do if I get on the board. And if those statements are false, they're actionable. And if suppose there is evidence presented to the court that irrespective of the merits and the claims may have merits, but the motivation is in bad faith designed to um, interfere with uh, um, or, pe or penalize people for their public advocacy. Well, is that money make a goes difference in, in your view? I, I think the, the rabbit goes into the hat. The, the act? I'm sorry. I think the rabbit goes into the hat when your honor says in bad faith. I think, is it, a, is it, is it in bad faith? Because the reason why these plaintiffs brought this case is because they didn't like the resolution. I don't think it is. As long as the claims are real claims, they're substantive claims. You don't only have to sue people you like. There's no that rule. Gets, that, that gets you out of any anti-slap act. Dismissed. No, I no, mean, no, if, no. You, if you show any merit to it, you don't have to worry about it. Well, uh, first of all, there's merit and then there's merit. But I think the first, the first prong is what are you suing them for doing? And that focuses on the claims. It doesn't focus on why do you really want to be here? There's no part of the statute that asks that question. And what do you say to their argument that it would gut the anti-slap act statute to say that if you focus on the claims themselves, then you can very crafty lawyers can very easily uh, make legal arguments that do not state the First Amendment basis of why they're really bringing their claim, that, it, that it's going to leave it uh, an empty act that's going to be vexatious litigation can run rampant without any check on it. Okay, so I think there are two answers to that question. The first is that the D.C. Council, unlike other jurisdictions, including, very importantly, California, specifically decided that it wanted to limit this statute to speech, right? And we presented in our brief the earlier version of this statute that went beyond that, that, went, that included expressive uh, other kinds of things that were related to speech. And we showed in the legislative history that the legislature decided, no, we want to limit this to speech. That was the legislature's conclusion. So it seems to me if the legislature concluded that, then that's where the inquiry stops. And then the other way of understanding it is in the question about the sale of the Buick, Buick Skylark. If I decide to enforce my rights against somebody that I'm mad at for some other reason, I don't see why that's relevant. If I have rights, I have rights. If I don't, I don't. And we don't ask why you're here. I mean, I, I, it's a general matter. You have no obligation to only sue your friends. And, and I think the, the suggestion that we're suing these people because we don't like them is not asking the right question. The question is, what did you sue them for? And does the case have merit? And the statute provides that in the what did you sue them for part of the inquiry, the only thing you can get in trouble for suing them for under SLAP is speech because it defines it in a particularly <coughs> narrow way. It says an act in furtherance of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest means, and then it lists things off. Any written or oral statement made in connection with blah, blah, blah in a place open to the public, which was one of Judge Easterly's questions. Any other expression or expressive conduct. Putting your hand in the cookie jar is not expression or expressive conduct. It's just not. And if, if the D.C. legislature, the D.C. council wanted to say, well, you can reach conduct that's not expression or expressive conduct if, it's a, if your claim is animated by hostility to expression or expressive conduct, they could have written the statute in a different I don't, way. I don't, animated well, by does not sound so different from arises from the movie. No, no, no. But the issue is not, the issue is, <laughs> no, it is different because animated by is animated by the litigants or their lawyers. Arising under allows us to look at the allegations and the claims and what is the relationship between those two things? They're objective. It's so not suppose, the allegation, suppose the allegation is um, you did something that you shouldn't have done. You had no authority as the officer of this um, organization to make this resolution, to issue this resolution. We're okay. suing you because you improperly issued that resolution. Now, um, is that, in your view, um, sufficient to satisfy the first prong? And let's assume that uh, you have a good argument that the officers did not have that authority. Okay. I think the difference is that there, it's just speech. All they did was talk. 
They just issued words. It's like a defamation claim. Whereas he, and the argument is, you. I mean, for example, suppose, I'll give another example, which I think is consistent with- You with embarrassed your, us, you embarrassed us members. Right. Something along these lines. Right, you know? right. I, yeah, I published so an editorial. A resolution we don't believe, in our name, which we don't believe, believe in. Right. I think- Now, my reaction is, that sounds like it falls within the anti-slap act, at least at first blush. I agree. I think it would, because it's expressive conduct. You wrote an editorial. You wrote an editorial that took a position that's at odds with the position of the organization. And you can't do that. I think, yes, I think because it's expression. It's not putting your hand in the cookie jar. It's not tortiously interfering with a contract. You use some of the organization's resources to issue that resolution. Now we're in a different... And then, and then when you were sued, you used some of the... I don't know the insurance, the organization's yeah. insurance <laughs> company. <laughs> right. To, well, you put uh, you 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 said this is a business expense. You know, I, I wrote one of the examples I think given by Miss LaHood was using uh, funds to litigate. Um, uh huh. Right. I, I do want to point out that that our claims about financial uh, impropriety are not limited by any means to money used to pay the lawyers in this case. They're, uh -huh. they're okay. I just want to make that clear. But yes, it seems to me that if the argument, I mean, think about it, let, let's abstract from this and let's just think about it in a, in a less heated context. You have a corporation and the president of the corporation, it's a publicly held corporation, the president of the corporation writes an editorial and he gets sued and he tells the, the company's lawyers to defend him. That's a garden variety breach of fiduciary duty claim. And it's not speech. He's just using corporate assets for his own personal purposes. And then there's going to be a question. Well, did he write the editorial in his capacity as an officer? And was it to advance the office company? Well, we all know how to do that. We, we know where we are in that context. No, there's no great amount of creative lawyering required to, to work our way through that problem. But this, the legislature here has given us a distinction. It said speech is covered, not speech, not covered. So... Yes, I think that if they simply issued a resolution and said, we think X about uh, Israel and the Arabs and Palestine. Yes, I think if we had sued them for that and said, you breached your fiduciary duty by speaking on that topic, I agree, that would be covered by the slapback. But that's not what we sued them for. There's no so, part of it. I, I think I, well, I started to count how many times the resolution is referenced in the complaint and I stopped after 100 Okay. So, so we just ignore that? No, you don't have to ignore it. The question is, what's it doing there? In other words, okay. is it there because we said this resolution really stinks and, and, and therefore you owe us money? Or is it there because they, we were talking about the re resolution and the question was, <laughs> you put up the resolution for a vote, you counted the votes wrong, you froze the voting rolls, and then, by the way, you ultimately had a vote about the resolution. That's the third time I've mentioned it. And you didn't get two thirds and you said the resolution passed. That's the fourth time. So yes, if I mentioned the resolution in the context of saying the rules required a two thirds vote, you didn't get two thirds and you said you won. Yes, I'm talking about the resolution. What isn't in the, what isn't in the complaint, Your Honor, and I think this should allay Your Honor's concerns. What isn't in the complaint is the substance of the resolution. In other words, we're never complaining about the resolution said X, but it should have said Y. But, but isn't the fact, if the claim itself is frivolous, if it's meritless, isn't that pretty strong evidence that the basis for it is the one that jumps off the page? So let, let, let's say that the argument was they needed 100% of the vote to pass this resolution, mm -hmm. and that that was plainly inconsistent with the bylaws, and that was the only claim you had made. Right. I would think they'd be able to say, look, this claim really arises out of the passage of the 2013 resolution, and you should dismiss under the Anti-SLAPP Act because this other thing is just a total pretext that they're using to vexatiously litigate that issue. Look, my answer to that is, though they should not be able to do it under the Anti-SLAPP Act, they should be able to do it under Rule 11. If they can't yeah, so, but, 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 the, but the whole point of the Anti-SLAPP Act is to prevent that type of vexatious suit against First Amendment practices, and it right. seems to be gutted if you're allowed to do it an end run. No, because because in the example that Your Honor just gave, the thing that was done wrong was not an, a First Amendment practice. I came into court and I said, you counted the votes wrong. That's a corporate practice. I was clearly full of baloney. They didn't count the votes wrong. Okay, I should be sanctioned for doing that. But it's not a speech act. 
Any more than any more than it's an act of I don't know sex. So I, I appreciate that it is not a speech act. My question is more: Does it arise from a speech act? And where it appears that the claim is a pretext in order to get at the speech, we might say that it arises from it. Well, I, I think that I think that we, you'd have to torture the statute. Look, I understand. I don't think that's a tortured use of the word arises from. We said substantially linked in Algernon uh, was enough. But I think I think that in a context here, where where the, the question is, what are, the statute is asking, the the uh, slap statute is asking, what are you being sued for? And the, the, it's clear that what the what the legislature principally had in mind, and the vast majority of these stat claims arise under, is a defamation claim, or something like that, a false light claim, where you're talking about words. And I'm, but I'm suggesting that formulaic approach to the anti-slap statute is going to be a very ineffectual slap statute. No, and I'm suggesting that that's not correct. And and what, what's bothering your honor is mm -hmm. the possibility that there could be an abuse which would escape um, sanction. And what I'm, what I'm responding with is there is no abuse that will escape sanction. There are two different abuses. One of them is an abuse of of an attack on speech, and another is an abuse of the judicial process, which we have just plenty of fine tools to deal with. And the fact that, I mean, I'll give you another example. Here, here's another example. Suppose I sue people because they're black or because they're Jews, and I only do that. I just sue people because of their religion. And I go into court and I do that. Have I violated the discrimination laws? Maybe, but I violated rule 11. If I file a meritless case because I don't like the race of the other party, I can be sanctioned under Rule 11. We don't have to invent new things in order to make sure that that kind of abuse is, goes unpunished or doesn't go unpunished. There's no need to do that. And there's no need to make this statute mean anything other than what it was intended to mean, which is to protect speech. And we're not, we're not prosecuting speech here. As I've made clear, we dropped people as defendants who engage in this speech. And there are plenty of other people who engage in this speech that we didn't sue. Mr. Marcus, you're, you're not asking us, though, to limit any slaps, to limit the application of special motions to dismiss under the anti-slap statute to certain causes of action. I, like I, defamation claims, right? I mean, no, no. I think the example that I, I forget which of the which member of the panel asked, but if I brought a breach of fiduciary duty claim, which is not a defamation claim, but I brought it because I said you spoke, and that constituted a breach of fiduciary duty. I agree. I agreed before that would be a violation. That would be reachable under the Slap Act because the basis for the claim, the bad thing that I said you did that gave rise to the claim for relief was speech. And whenever that's true, I agree that the SLAP Act can reach it. But that's not what these people have been sued for. We didn't say you spoke and therefore you owe us money. Your speech constituted the act which gives rise to the claim. And I think the, the, the earlier case that, that the court has Suppose been asking- the claim is, Let's focus again on the rises from. Uh -huh. Suppose the claim is you spoke, we opposed it, because we opposed it, you punished us. Well, then I think then I think you then all you're really saying is I'm punishing you because of the speech that you made in response. Which I, I agree. If the claim for relief is you spoke, I mean, put it the other way. Uh, my clients, which they didn't, and some of them actually don't have a position on the on the Arab-Israeli conflict. They just don't like academic boycotts. But suppose one of them made a made a a, a, a public statement. And, and somebody else in the, in the ASA made a response and said, he's wrong, uh, Israel's bad, or Oi, academic boycotts are good, or some other thing. And we sued them for that statement. Yes, I agree, that would be reachable, regardless of what we called it, whether we called it a breach of fiduciary duty, or uh, I don't know what, uh, but if we sued it, and if we sued them and said, the thing which you did wrong, which gave rise to the claim, was words coming out of your mouth. That's reachable under SLAP, regardless of what you call it. But if it's taking money out of a bank account, it's not. If it's counting votes wrong, it's not. If it's freezing voter rolls, where, where you, you, we have email traffic, where they actually sit there and say, no, let's freeze the voting roll on this day, because that's the day when we can maximize the number of votes in our favor and minimize the number of votes against us. 
That's not about speech. That's plain old abuse of, of corporate governance rules. It would be no different if it happened outside of this context. Now, Mr. Marcus, let's switch gears for a moment and consider the question of the second mm -hmm. uh, prong of the anti slap uh, statute. The appellants um, argue that uh, the trial court erred by um, uh, failing to consider um, the likelihood of success on a claim by claim, dependent by defendant um, met, uh, basis, and that um, the plaintiffs um, failed in their duty to present evidence to support and, and show that, that their uh, claims uh, had a likelihood of success. You want to speak to that? I certainly do. So <laughs> this panel, uh, as astonishingly well prepared as it is, and it's a joy to talk to such a panel, um, uh, has the great good fortune of not having lived with this case for the last five years. And so you do not know that the defense- I hope that's true for the next five years as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> The defendants in this case have, have, I won't say abused because it's not this court's problem to decide if it's abuse or not, but suffice it to say that virtually every document produced in this case was marked confidential and they have attempted in every forum and at every step to prevent us from using those materials. Most recent and relevant of these incidents is that they fought like the Dickens to prevent us from even filing the redacted complaint in court, even under seal. They didn't want Judge Rigsby to see it. And they fought like heck to prevent us from being able to show these materials to the court. So the idea that they now stand here and say, oh, you guys should have put in the emails and you should have put in the documents, which we would, they threatened us with sanctions for filing the complaint just filing a pleading in court under seal. And they threatened us, us with sanctions for that. So if we had the temerity to actually take all these documents, which we obviously have, they haven't denied the, the accuracy of a single one of these quotations. We got their emails and discovery. We have the deposition transcripts. We have the financial records. We have it all. And it's all marked confidential. If we had had the temerity to say, oh, we want to file this stuff in court so the court can see it, uh, I, I, the screaming would have been heard in California. I mean, I say, the, well, wait a minute. I, this is a little hard to imagine. Are you saying that if you had made the evidentiary showing that you claim you could make to establish that there's a likelihood of success on the merits on these claims, mm -hmm. and if you had made that showing by filing the documents under seal, that you would have been in, uh, th that something prevented you from doing that? I'm saying that the lengths to which we had to go to file a document which quoted these materials was astounding. And there was never a request to actually see the documents, all of which they have. There was never a claim that the, the stuff that we quoted was inaccurate. Can I just ask for a clarification? So I asked them if they had raised this argument below. They said they did in their reply. Um, and do you take issue with that? That they said in their reply? No, I, 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 the I, evidence? I, I thought I don't have time to go check. That's okay. I have, I, I, I don't I'll, recall. I'm happy to look at it myself. I, okay. you know, do you have I, a recollection? I, I, I do not. I do not okay. have a recollection. But I do have a recollection of this, that when we were in court arguing the motion to dismiss, the defendants wanted to close the courtroom to prevent us from even using the unredacted complaint. They wouldn't let, and as I said, we wanted to, we filed a motion for leave to file the unre unredacted complaint under seal. The only people who would have seen it were Judge Rigsby and the court personnel, and they opposed that. And they threatened us with the, sanctions. The issue is not simply showing particular evidence, but making the case, the, the claim by claim okay, so explanation that's the second, right. as that's to the, how you would succeed. Or, I understand. Um, so that's the second issue. The one, one is, why didn't you put in the, the hard evidence? And I, I think I've addressed that at least as best I can. The second question is, did we need to go claim by claim? So I think the first answer is the defendants didn't go claim by claim. I noticed that. All they did was they said, you guys hate us and that's why you brought this case. <laughs> 
And I think we've answered that. We answered the argument that they made. And I think that's what we were required to do. So I, I don't think we had to go claim by claim. I think that to the extent that, for example, in Mann, where the court did go claim by claim, it went, it went, it wasn't actually, it went, it went, um, asserted defamatory statement by asserted defamatory statement, which is how you would have to, that's how you would ever have, that's the only way that I can think of to go through a defamation claim and figure out what are you dealing with here? What do we have? But part of the problem with going claim by claim, and this also relates to the problem of what does it mean to succeed on the merits, is that if you're talking about a claim which is not about speech, it's not a claim that the defendant spoke and therefore owes me money, but it is instead a claim that the defendant's took money out of the bank account, or they froze voter rolls, or they tortuously interfered with a contract, or they decided to close down a journal rather than leave somebody running it who took a position they didn't want. And by the way, that's important for two reasons. One reason it's important, and there was some suggestion that, oh, it's just a journal. It's not really an important part of the organization. There are five officers of the American Studies Association. One of them is the editor of that journal. And that means that the person who's in that position is in a position of very substantial power and they have substantial rights, including the right to bring derivative claims. And the defendants decided that they wanted Dr. Professor Bronner out of that position for reasons that we explain in the complaint have nothing to do with the merits of his capacity as an editor and have nothing to do with their desire to replace him with somebody else because they didn't replace him with anybody else. They have nobody else. Well, one related question to the arises from inquiry that we pressed you on a lot mm -hmm. is when I hear your answers, what it sounds to me like is you think you can tell by looking at the complaint, by looking at whether or not a speech act is really being targeted uh, by the claim itself. What's a little troubling for me with that interpretation is the statute speaks in terms of making a prima facie case of the claim arising out of a speech act. Now, if it's true that you can tell by looking at it, if you can tell by the nature of the claim itself, you would think a prima facie case would, there's no difference between a prima facie case and a perfectly legally adequate case. There would never be a chance to revisit that later because you could tell it all just by looking at the complaint. Whereas if it's a factual inquiry about what's really, um, you know, the impetus, the, the substantial link between the speech and the claim, you might think a prima facie case could be undermined by later evidence, but, but the way you pitch it doesn't seem like there's a difference between prima facie case and an ultimate legal conclusion. Do you follow? I mean, that was convoluted. So I forgive you. If you uh, I'm, not, I'm not, I think I might understand the question, but if your honor wouldn't mind. I, I think I'm, uh, just to boil it down, by virtue of saying that the first question is whether or not there's a prima facie case mm -hmm. of whether or not the claim arises from a speech act. Seems at odds with your view that you can tell definitively from the nature of the claim itself, whether or not it arises from a speech. speech. Oh, because the there's- some... case sounds like something that might be undermined by later evidence or factual development, but your very claim focused uh, approach doesn't seem like a prima facie case um, could ever later be undermined by it, if, if that makes sense. I hear, I hear, I hear the point. I, and I respect it. I, I think my answer would be this. I, it seems to me what's going on with this statute out of a desire to protect speech is that the court is saying, excuse me, the, the DC council is saying, you have to make this showing. It may not ultimately be the world's most definitive showing, but if there's a substantial chance that the claim actually arises out of speech, I mean, take our example of Take our example of the breach of fiduciary duty because you wrote an editorial, okay? And suppose that the, the, uh, uh, an officer of a company writes an editorial. I mean, officers of companies are writing a lot of editorials these days and saying a lot of things about issues of public importance. And suppose somebody comes along and says, Mr. President of Coca-Cola, you shouldn't be talking about that. You should be making fuzzy drinks and not talking about anything else. And it's a breach of fiduciary duty for you to be doing that. Now, is that a question of speech 
Well, yeah, maybe he's going to he's going to argue that it's part of his, it's it, he's well within the business judgment rule by deciding that he wants to talk about that and that it's important for his company to talk about that and that there are employee relations reasons and, and all kinds of other reasons for talking about it. So I think what the legislature is saying here is if it looks like it's a, there's a really good chance that that's what's going on, then we have to move to prompt two. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I don't think it undermines the argument that I'm making. And I also, I also think there'll be problems the other way, right? I think that we also have a right to go to court. Everybody has, we have a right to petition. We have a right to present a claim in court. That's a first amendment right too. And I think if the argument is, well, you really don't have that right because we know you're only doing it because you hate those guys. That's gonna give rise to problems in the other direction, which would also have a constitutional dimension to them as was suggested, I think, in one of the, one of the amicus, amicus briefs. So I think that what the court is doing here is it's really taking a, a, a selection of, of standards from Rule 11, from Rule 56, from Rule 12, and it's saying cases that are about speech, that is to say cases where what's being litigated is the speech, are of special concern to us. And so we're gonna create these rules which, by the way, are rules where a claim could survive 12b6 and still fail SLAP, or it could succeed under SLAP and fail under 12b6, as, as the cases that we cite say, because this is a unique inquiry. It's a special animal. And it's a special animal that exists because the court, excuse me, the legislature wants to protect speech, but it also understands that there are limitations on how you can do that. And so it's created this process, and I don't think that undermines the argument that I've been making about what is the claim really about? What is the claim really about doesn't mean what really is animating these people for bringing that claim. Um, One final question before you sit down, if I may, on another area. Please. There's been some discussion about whether... Um, like to cap encapsulate this in one sentence, but the interrelationship between grounds to dismiss under Rule 12b-6 and um, likelihood of success on, on the merits. Right. Um, do you want to speak briefly to yes. uh, your position on that sure. um, issue? Sure. Uh, I want to speak. I'll try to make it brief. Um, we've cited a line of cases, uh, most prominently the Hilton case, but also the Park case in, in, the, DC, in, in the DC courts, um, which make clear that um, the 12B6 inquiry and the SLAP inquiry are, are separate inquiries. And when you, when you think about, I think, this court's decision in MAM, where the court really engaged in an act of of very careful creation in talking about what is what is the um, likelihood of success? What does that mean? And it fashioned a standard that was unique for SLAP. And it did that trying to balance all of the considerations that the SLAP statute mandates courts consider. And it created a standard which is unique. That's what the court said, and it is unique. It's not just, could you get to a jury? It's not just, does it state a claim? It's a unique set of facts focused on speech, the speech which is at the center of the case, the speech which is said to give rise to the claim, the speech which is wrongful and whose wrongfulness means the defendant owes the plaintiff money. And that was the question. And so that's why there are all these cases that say, no, you can have a, a situation where a case survives 12b6 it states a claim but it's still going to fail under slap and you can have a case where it fails under 12b6 but survives slap i do think that um the inquiry is complicated i'm sorry i'm perplexed about that notion that you can have a claim that survives under um slap but uh Oh, I've lost you, haven't I? Hello? There you are. Did I freeze for a minute? You That's because the battery on my iPad is, is uh, down oh, to 10%. Um, the, the, uh, um, I mean, imagine a case in which, well, for example, take this case in which the defendants 
say, uh, look, um, you can't win your defamation claim against us or whatever, no. because um, we have immunity, statutory immunity, or because of collateral estoppel uh, defenses, or because the statute of limitations has passed, your claim is completely untimely, and you have no basis to get around that time bar. Um, just as a matter of logic, it seems hard to say that anything but that the plaintiffs can't show a likelihood of success on the merits under those circumstances. I, I think I think that the inquiry that the court is being asked to make under SLAP is different, and that's why the timing of these motions is different. A motion to dismiss is due before a SLAP motion. A motion to dismiss is due 21 days after a complaint is filed. A SLAP motion is due 45 days after a complaint is filed. And I think that in the same way that you could have an abusive process claim, which is separate from a, uh, a 12B6 claim, where the question is, has the, has the party done something abusive? I mean, the statute of limitations example, I think is a good example. I blow the statute by a day. Okay, I, I, I'm out of court. But that's not the same as being, uh, as being, um, uh, as having committed an abusive process, because the inquiry is different. And I think the inquiry under SLAP is, and the court said this in man, is this a case that wasn't brought to be won? And you could have a case that wasn't brought to be won, even if it failed under 12b6, because the plaintiff did his best. I mean, a, 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 a very good example is present in this case. We brought claims in 2016 in federal court. They sat there for three years, and finally, Judge Contreras decided to throw them out. And then we walked across the street and filed them in state court. And the defendant said, oh, look at that. Ha, ha, ha. At a time, you're, 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 the statute's blown. And you should have known when you filed in 2016 that you were in the wrong place, even though Judge Contreras wrote two opinions in which he refused to throw us out on, on a mounting controversy requirement. So, okay, finally, he changes his mind. And we're in court. <clears throat> we're in court here. And we lose on the statute. Now, do I think, would I concede that even though we lose, assuming he's right, Judge Rigsby, which I don't think he was, but for present purposes, that's where we are. We've lost on, on statute of limitations grounds. Does, do I think that means that we violated the SLAP Act? That that means that we only brought these claims because we were trying to silence people? It didn't mean that when we filed them in federal court across the street three years ago. So we refile them, we refile them now literally five weeks after we were thrown out of federal court, we were in state court. We just had to reformulate the complaint and file. Can it be that the same claim in that circumstance, which assuming Judge Rigsby is right, the statute's blown. So we're not able to establish a claim on the merits, we failed. Can it be that that suddenly becomes a claim and that is a, an effort to suppress speech, a, a claim that we brought knowing that we had no intention of litigating it to judgment. We just did this to afflict the defendants. How can that possibly be right? It can't be right. There are all kinds of reasons why a claim could fail under 12b-6, that being, I think, a good example, where it's perfectly obvious that it wasn't a violation of the SLAP Act when we filed it the first time. So... How can it be a violation of the slap back when we file it the second time? Now, the defendants will say, well, wait a second, the slap back doesn't apply in federal court. And they're right. But they had other ways to challenge our, our motivations. And believe me, they did everything they could to challenge our motivations in federal court as in state court. So, yes, I think there are examples where a case can, can fail in a 12B6 and still not be in violation of the slap back. Um, there are a couple other points that... Um, I'm going to get up while you're talking and see if I can plug this in so that I don't get it. So you don't disappear again. Um, I don't know if the court wants to hear me on uh, the, the merits of these claims. We, we, do, we do believe that the merits of the claim, the merits arguments, Okay. Thank you. We do believe that the merits arguments are not properly before this court. This is an appeal of the slapback decision, and it can't be 
that every time a slapback motion is denied, along with a 12B6 motion, that defendants get to bring the whole case, excuse me, yeah, the defendants get to bring the whole case up to the Court of Appeals. That can't be right. Um, because it would defeat the entire purpose of creating a special appeal, which this court did in Mann, to address the issues unique to the SLAP Act uh, statute and its procedure. What the defendants are saying is, what that means is, every 12B6 motion that gets denied is immediately appealable if there's a SLAP Act, if there's a SLAP motion alongside it. And that, that just can't be right. That's not what the court said in Mann. That's not what the appeal that was created by Mann was created to do. Um, having said that, um, the defendants have suggested that uh, Professor Salado or other people were only sued for speaking. It's just not so. If you read the complaint, it's absolutely clear. These people were sued for engaging in substantive acts of um, uh, hands in the cookie jar, approving hands in the cookie jar. Professor Salado was on the board when um, the bylaws were changed without notice to the membership to permit larger withdrawals of money, and that money was used to fund the defendant's hobby. Uh, that's that's a hand in the cookie jar claim, Your Honor. That's not uh, he said something we don't like claim. Uh, the same for Professors Puar um, and, and the other individual defendants who have who have uh, whose lawyers have spoken here. The Volunteer Protection Act does not apply. Um, when willful action is alleged, the statute does not require that the willful action target an individual. If you read the statute, it's clear there's a comma, and it's talking about willful action or action that targets an individual. It's not willful action that targets an individual. Two courts have rejected that argument now. Uh, and as I say, it's not properly before the court, but if it is, it should be rejected, just as the other two courts have rejected. Um, I don't have anything else. If the panel has more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'll be quiet. Okay, counsel, thank you. Thank you. Let us hear now uh, how the uh, uh, appell appellant's counsel want to respond, since there's three of you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I will take just two points uh, to clarify the record, and then I will see to Ms. LaHood. Uh, these two points. First of all, on the uh, the question of sealing the complaint and filing the redacted, unredacted complaint, we did not and we never did argue that Judge Rigsby could not see it, and we did not argue that the motion should be, the, the hearing should be closed. I think the transcript is clear on that. Our argument on filing the unredacted complaint was simply that it was way too long and it, it, the redacted complaint was too long. Rule 8 requires a short motion, a notice of, of pleading, not a 300-page tome. Uh, I would also, and, and on, on that point, uh, well, no, I've made that point. On the question of revising the, amending the bylaws to start, uh, make, make sure that uh, Dr. Bronner was not an officer, that had nothing to do with derivative claims. We've made that argument in the reply brief. The fact of the matter is the derivative claims were dismissed because plaintiffs only gave two days notice before bringing the lawsuit. And as Judge Contreras noted in his opinion, you can't cure that. So Dr. Bronner's ability to bring a derivative claim was dead on arrival, even if they would, the bylaws had never been amended. I wanted to correct the record on those two points, and then I will see to Ms. LaHood. Thank you. Uh, Ms. LaHood? Thank you, Your Honors. I have several points, not necessarily in order. I mean, first, as to what a claim is, the claim is defined as the D.C. Council defined it, not as Mr. Marcus would like it defined. Um, his his uh, claims about why Ms. Gordon was dropped from the case, they're not in the record. Um, they, uh, they don't have to sue the hundreds of people that were in favor of the resolution in order to be targeting, but it doesn't even matter because targeting isn't the question. It's again about, about the various acts. Um, they, they say that they, claim, that they sued the people who did the acts, but they don't actually say who did any of these particular acts. Um, the, one, the one claim, I mean, Mr. Marcus conceded that writing an editorial would be something that would fall under the Anti-SLAPP Act, which is what Professor or, or Dr. Slida is accused of. They didn't say, one, he didn't say one other thing that Dr. Slida or any other defendant did 
that fall that would fall under the anti-slap act except putting your hands in the cookie jar, jar and approving that he mentioned the bylaw amendment that um, again would have permitted funding the litigation that they didn't notify the membership in the bylaws which are attached to the complaint article 13 section 1 says they don't have to notify the membership about amending the bylaws that's not a claim that's not even a factual it doesn't it doesn't matter he also says the claims were about more than funding the litigation. They weren't. The, if you look at this- Ms. Lehut, before you go on too long, can you just articulate what you would have us adopt as a test for what types, what claims arise out of um, an act in furtherance of advocacy? But what is, what would we say? Uh, what's the dividing line? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure I can say more than I said before on this. If, if I mean, here, I would say that this entire complaint arises out of the boycott resolution, which falls under the Anti-SLAPP Act. If that seems too broad to this court. No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that you would say that about this case. I, what I'm wondering is what rule would we announce that could be fairly applied by trial courts in future cases? I mean, I think the rule should follow, should track the, the statute, Your Honor. I think- But, but the, the statute is horribly ambiguous about what arises from means. And I think you've gotten the sense that all three of us have different views, maybe different views than what we had two hours ago on that I, question. So yeah. I, I'm asking I, what would we say? And I'm not getting a lot of guidance. I think looking to Algernon, as you mentioned, to show that it should be broadly interpreted, that it needs to be something that's, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's a predicate. Without the boycott resolution, this case would not have happened. And that is clearly true in this case. It so arose, a but for causation. A but for cause is what you're looking for. Uh, I guess that's right. I mean, Mr. Marcus has articulated a very specific standard saying it has to be about speech, right? Um, doesn't matter the nature of the claim, right? Could be a breach of fiduciary duty claim, could, right? But it, it has to be about speech. And you're saying speech is the but for cause? I'm saying the same thing. It's how, it's how broadly you look at it. Of course, it has to be about speech. First of all, Mr. Marcus is wrong about the legislative history in the ACLU, but we do not dispute that it has to be based on speech or expression or expressive conduct as defined in the statute. It doesn't mean that every single you know, thing that's mentioned. Again, Mr. Marcus did mention one single act that isn't speech that makes up the basis of his complaint. Nothing, he didn't mention one. He said, thought, putting your hands in the Not car. respecting the vote, treating the resolution as having passed when it failed to get two thirds vote. Like, so, so, so that claim is not against Dr. Salida and it is, a, it is a statute of limitations problem and I'm dealing with all the ones that are actually- okay. But assume- Okay, I mean, it just seems like you're kind of not helping us draw lines, so. I know. think if you look to the, the actual, if you look at the breakdown, the elements of a claim and the factual allegations that support them, I think, you know, I think the Calif what the California court have done is actually struck all factual allegations that fall under the statute. So anything that is, you know, speech or expressive conduct that would um, support this, and I think that's what they can. You give an can you give an allegation? Can you give an example of an allegation in the complaint here that you would say the California Supreme Court would strike because it's about speech, or or whatever test they apply? I think every single allegation which should be struck because it's about speech, because again, I haven't heard what's not about speech. I, I guess there was the example you just gave, which was, again, I'm sorry, that's not, it's not an account I've, I've dealt with, but about, um, and, and you know, the, I feel like we're going back to the same argument, but it, it is in connection with an issue of public interest. It's in connection with the policy dispute about about Palestine and Israel, right? I, I think was the was the question. I'm sorry. Was the question about not, well, that's not what, sharing that's information? Okay. I mean, that's a very broad definition. Then you're saying that any cause of action that has a connection with uh, an act of speech is um, is fair game for the anti-slap motion to dismiss. No. 
Not that's even just about, as I said, about a public policy debate writ large. As, as I mean, I've said, the act, the, the statute has to apply. The, the factual allegations underlying the claims, if they fall under the Anti-SLAPP Act, it applies. So I, I, I'm trying hard to think of something in the complaint where it would not apply because the allegations against the defendants are, again, I just gave the, the amend of the bylaws. Okay, maybe, I don't know, a, amending bylaws generally might not fall under. Here, the allegation is that they amended bylaws so that they could take out money to fund litigation. I and my reaction that to that, Ms. LaHood, that's a good example because the problem I have, and I want you to address it, is um, that it may be the case that amending bylaws to enable yourselves to fund litigation uh, is protected by the First Amendment or is speech in some sense, but it, I, that is not an act of public act. It does not fall within the definition that um, the statute gives of an act of public advocacy. Uh, um, and that is my uh, concern here. I, I read that definition as applying the only thing that that definition applies to in this case that I'm aware of and that I thought was being argued was the resolution. And so a claim, a claim based on falsity in the resolution or misuse of the resolution in some sense, or um, the speaker didn't have the authority to make, to give, to um, declare that resolution. Those are claims I think I can see as arising from the resolution. But I don't know that um, the example you just gave of amending the bylaws in order to uh, make funds available so that they could you know, uh, issue the resolution and defend the resolution um, falls within that category. Uh, Your Honor, it might be a close call. The thing is, is you can put lots of allegations that aren't material to the claim into the complaint. Here, amending the bylaws is immaterial because on the face of the complaint, they did not need to notify the membership. Again, Article 13, Section 1 of the bylaws. It's immaterial that they amended, the, that they didn't notify the members. So what? They amended the complaint. It's not a material basis of the actual claim, whatever that claim that is, fiduciary duty breach or whatever they brought it under. Well, the so maybe wrong. these past I mean, is- I mean, the claim the, may or may not have merit. But, it, but the question is different. The question is whether it is the kind of claim that um, uh, is, is meant to be protected under the Anti-SLAPP Act. It's a factual allegation to support a claim. And, and I guess what the court could suggest is that if you look to what are, the, what are the factual allegations that support a claim, do those factual allegations fall under the Anti-SLAPP Act? If they do, the anti-slack, you know, the, the act applies, and then you see, was there evidence to show that it's likely to move forward or not? And, and, I, and again, that's, that's why I asked you earlier, give me an example of a factual allegation in this complaint, a specific example of one that, um, I guess the words you use, fall, fall under the um, uh, anti-slap act. That's what I gave previously, Your Honor. The ones, the the funding of litigation falls under the Anti-SLAPP Act. The, okay, there the I don't, I don't understand that, to be honest. I'm also confused. It, it sounds like you're saying, okay, let's look at a claim and we don't have to look at the facts that are material to the claim. We look at the facts that aren't material to the claim and those facts can make something an anti-SLAPP suit. Is that uh, so you look to whatever facts the plaintiffs allege support their claim. They may, you may say, but that doesn't support the claim. So it's still an anti-slap act just because the plaintiffs did a poor job showing, of, of alleging things, the facts to support their claims doesn't bring it out from underneath the anti-slap act. The factual allegations are speech or expressive conduct that fall under the anti-slap statute. But, but they're non-material facts to their claim. 
right? They I mean, can the, be the plaintiffs, an order. the plaintiffs are there saying this doesn't have anything to do with our claim. These are not material to proof of our claim. We're, we're trying to show, you know, misuse of funds, breach of fiduciary duty. So the facts about the resolution don't have, are not material to our claim, but the non-material facts are what make this an anti-slap in your view. No, I think any facts, any alleged facts before you even determine could be, could make it an anti-slap issue, right? If they're, if the, if whatever the claims are like here, if the underlying facts are brought under the Anti-SLAPP Act because their speech or expressive conduct and the Anti-SLAPP Act applies. What I'm saying is you, can, you can't say, but the, the complaint also alleges that their car is blue, to, give, to go back to the car example, and that's not an act, the, the Anti-SLAPP Act doesn't apply. It's immaterial if their car is blue, just like it's immaterial if they amended the bylaws. So, I, I think there has to be, you know, if you put in a 200 page complaint, again, I haven't heard one example, and this is maybe a better question for, you know, what, for Mr. Marcus, what are the acts that they are alleging were done by the defendants that actually are underlie their claims? He, if, he, if I may say, he said that there were other acts, he didn't say what they were, like, or the litigation, the fund, um, the withdrawal of the funds could be used for something other than litigation. Those things as stated in the complaint, which are all barred by the statute of limitations, but were for a new website, which was not resolution related. So it has nothing to do with it. A media strategist and PR consultant, those are things to put out, you know, statements about the resolution. So that falls under the Anti-SLAPP Act. And then arguably for payments around a meeting. They don't even allege there were payments around a meeting. They don't know. The other expenditure they said was that the executive committee approved directors and officers, officers insurance. So that's, that's somehow related. Is it related because plaintiffs sued defendants and then they wanted to get uh, DNO insurance? It's, you have to, you can't just say there are above acts that are alleged that don't fall into the Anti-SLAPP Act without actually saying what they are. And that's the analysis that should have been done. Um, as, to, as to Judge Deal's question about did we raise whether there was evidence, yes, and on pages 14 or 15 of our appellate reply, we say all the places below that we did. And in each of our replies, we mentioned it and an oral argument, it's in the transcript and those, those sites are there. And I believe we did argue that, that each, why each claim should be dismissed claim by claim. So I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure how to, how to respond to that. Um, the, this, the, back to the, the question, and, and I don't know, maybe we've already discussed it enough, but the, the statute of limitations example, first of all, you know, yes, Judge Jill is right. The court can refrain from, from awarding fees if it's unjust. But again, the statute of limitations is an affirmative defense under Rule 8, and Mann says that winning on the merits includes as defenses. Um, here, I just want to say that the ASA resolution was passed in 2013. Plaintiffs didn't bring suit until 2016. That was after the DC Circuit decided that the Anti-SLAPP Act didn't apply in federal court. So it was their cho choice of forum to go to the federal court. Uh, I, I understand procedural arguments might not fall under the Anti-SLAPP Act. That's why we didn't, frankly, uh, appeal the personal jurisdiction argument by Judge Rigsby, which was wrong, but I, I think probably could be considered procedural. Um, I think everyone knows that, that the 12 v 6 motion is not appealable and we're not arguing that. I think everyone understands that. The First Amendment right to petition point, the DC Council balanced that right with the First Amendment right to speak out on an issue of public interest and the court and man upheld the statute's confidentiality. The plaintiffs have the burden here of, of, of providing evidence and on the first prong, it is not onerous as, as several courts have found. Uh, just to repeat again, the purpose of the Anti-SLAPP Act, it's to fend off suits exactly like this one, exactly where one side is trying to punish the other side in a public policy debate, even if they can come up with a hundred and, you know, whatever pages um, of supposed allegations. But when you get to their core, the core of the allegations, the actual facts, they, are, they fall under the Anti-SLAPP Act, so they should be dismissed. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kleiman, are you uh, batting clean up here or no? Uh, okay, you're you're muted, so we can't hear you. You're still muted, so we can't hear you. Yeah. You don't know he's how not, to he's, 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 saying, not he's, gonna, he's not talking. No. <laughs> um, well, uh, we will take the case as submitted. And thank, thank you, you all for a very interesting and extensive uh, argument. Um, we, you, you are excused and um, you may log off. Thank you. This honorable, court, this honorable court is now adjourned.